I would normally say it's a great, great pleasure to have all of you here with us at Oslo Met, but I can't really say that today. But I can say that we are really happy to see that so many have signed up to follow this seminar, this conference online. We have a stream and we will have most of the participants or the presenters on Zoom. So if you'd like to um, ask questions, don't hesitate. You can send questions using the chat um, in the Zoom or in the stream. Please do that. Um, I, my name is Roy Krövel. I'm a professor at Oslo Met. I'm a co-organizer of the conference with Publish What You Pay in Norway. So I um, give the word to Mona Thorsen, who is the General Secretary of Publish What You Pay Norway. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Money laundering and tax avoidance and evasion, it contributes to crime and also unacceptably high levels of inequality globally. At our Making Transparency conference, bankers, economists, investigative journalists, whistleblowers and academics, they all contribute and will discuss what can be done to make finance more transparent. Understanding the phenomenon of illicit financial flows, it requires input from several disciplines, including law, finance and economics, and much of what is known about illicit financial flows today is thanks to whistleblowers. Our first two keynote speakers at our conference today are two internationally known whistleblowers. And first of all, thank you for believing in the public's right to know and the duty to tell. To Bradley C. Birkenfeld, who is an American retired investment professional and the most significant whistleblower in financial history. Johanna Stefansson is the Icelandic financial whistleblower and former managing director of Samhari operations in Namibia. We are delighted and honored to have you with us here today. And in order to frame a debate and to do an interview with our two whistleblowers, we are very fortunate to have with us Hege Mo Eriksson, a well-renowned journalist from the Norwegian Broadcasting Corporation, the public broadcaster in Norway. Over to you, Hege. Welcome. Thank you so much, Muna. Thank you. Uh, as you said, it is our pleasure to have two exceptional whistleblowers with us today, Mr. Bradley Birkenfeld and, uh, from the US and Mr. Johannes Stefansson from Iceland. They both gave the public crucial information about tax fraud and corruption, and yet their fate is quite different. Birkenfeld is a protected whistleblower and Stefansson is not. Each of them will give their own story before we discuss some common issues, but we'll start with uh, Bradley Birkenfield with us from the US live. We know it's 3.30 in the morning, so we're so happy that you're joining us uh, from Boston, I believe you said. Welcome, Bradley. Um, you are a former banker who exposed how the Swiss bank UBS helped wealthy Americans commit billions in tax fraud. You've received the biggest reward to a whistleblower in history, $104 billion for providing this information. So please, Bradley, the floor is yours. Can you hear me fine? Okay. Wonderful. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, as I say, from Boston, Massachusetts, my hometown. I'm actually visiting here in the States, but I reside in Malta. Um, what I did as a director at UBS in Geneva, Switzerland, was uh, expose the largest and longest running tax fraud in the world that UBS was committing, not just in the US, but in many other countries around the world. It's important that people understand that whistleblowing is important not just uh, as a matter of an ethical right, but also to eradicate waste, fraud, and corruption in our society. 
The problem we have today is we do have many problems uh, with cross-border uh, tax evasion and money laundering. And the problem is, is that it's very hard to detect this without an internal person uh, or a whistleblower for that matter. And the laws in America are quite different, of course, than those in Europe. And I think that's something that really must be highlighted. The difference is, is that, of course, um, Senator Grassley, who um, wrote the laws here in America, have been the most significant laws in American history of returning monies to the American taxpayer. Uh, to date, uh, there's been over $100 billion returned to the taxpayers from uh, illicit activities that uh, have been exposed by whistleblowers. America has also developed other whistleblowing laws, not just on tax, but on securities laws with the SEC, with the, the currency um, um, exchange, as well as other areas within the government and agencies that actually protect, but also compensate whistleblowers. And I think that's the big difference between America and uh, Europe, is that some of the laws are very uh, loose in Europe, and they're certainly not strong enough to entice whistleblowers to come forward. The reverse argument would be that some people say people should do it out of an ethical obligation. The problem with just it being an ethical obligation to do the right thing, let's say, is that it's not that easy. If someone is possibly married or has a family, um, certainly is afraid to come forward because they might be intimidated or harassed or even fired or harmed, these are some of the obstacles of having whistleblowers to come forward and do the right thing. I think in America, uh, certainly the whistleblowing laws have been uh, constructed in such a way to make it easier for people to understand that not only can you come forward and be protected, but you might also be compensated. It's just a big sticking point, as I said, again, between um, North America and Europe, because uh, I think most Europeans that I've noticed through my lectures have been a little bit reluctant to look at it as something where someone should be compensated. I've come to Norway several times and lectured on this matter, and I think it's important to understand that it's necessary to incentivize uh, whistleblowers because there's so much at risk, uh, as I said before. So I think it's important for people to understand uh, people get paid for a variety of other functions and giving information, maybe on a drug dealer, an armed smuggler, uh, or even terrorist financing for that matter. And I think what it does is it allows someone to um, continue with maybe possibly um, they have costs of losing their job or legal uh, fees and so forth. But something very important that I hope the EU directive takes this more seriously to uh, implement um, protections and uh, compensation. The situation that I encountered in Switzerland was that what we were doing in Switzerland was legal. The problem was, was when we left Switzerland to go to America, and for that matter, any other country, where the laws don't um, support such uh, aggressive uh, banking tactics. Switzerland, for that matter, has been uh, a bit too, as I say, aggressive in doing this, and they got caught doing it because when I first was uh, addressing the problem of an internal document that actually tried to um, counter what we were doing for traveling and seeing existing and potential clients, that's where the bank had actually written a different policy and put it within our internal computer system. That actually contradicted what we were doing, so I actually challenged that because I could see that the bank was more interested in protecting themselves rather than protecting, say, the bankers, the clients, or the shareholders. So this was a very uh, interesting situation. It involved, as I say, the legal and compliance departments, and I addressed it to them directly, but they ignored me for three consecutive months. At that point, I quit the bank, and then I took my complaints directly to the board of directors. Now, this was a very aggressive strategy, but I thought it was important because as a foreigner working in Switzerland, I could see exactly what the bank was trying to do, was protect their interests, but not, um, as I say, the bankers or the clients or the shareholders. Ultimately, I had to go to my own country, America, to report this uh, massive uh, tax scandal, which ultimately was exposed and blew up. Um, unfortunately for myself, I didn't feel as though my own government would have attacked me, but um, 
the American uh, government is somewhat corrupt here. And what they don't like is to be exposed for not doing their job or uh, failing to um, crack down on tax evasion. And that's exactly what I did. I exposed 19,000 uh, American clients with $20 billion in assets. So you can imagine this was the largest and longest running tax scandal in the world. Uh, not just the U.S. markets, I say, but it was uh, multiple markets around the world, Norway, Germany, Japan, South Africa, Argentina, and so forth. So there was a global criminal cartel, and I say that quite candidly, because what we've seen recently, or after my initial historic whistleblowing, was we had the Panama Papers, LuxLeaks, uh, just recently the FinCEN um, exposures. So you can see that I guess we really haven't learned much over the last decade because I started my whistleblowing back in 2005 in Switzerland, and then ultimately it ballooned in 2008 during the financial crisis. I think it's important for all of us to realize that if you want to get serious about eradicating uh, tax evasion and money laundering, which undermines our society, um, governments have to get a little bit more strict. They have to impose uh, stiffer penalties jail terms, and so forth. And if they're not going to do that, then what you're going to see is a continuation of this. It'll set a bad precedent, number one. And number two, uh, banks and financial institutions in my industry, of course, um, will continue doing this, as we've seen. And, and certainly, we saw some uh, very big cases, uh, even in Estonia, with uh, Dendanska Bank and some of the money laundering that was going on there. And then, as I say, recently, the FinCEN exposures by ICIJ. So I think it's important for people to realize that not only do uh, the whistleblowing laws need to be put in place, but they need to be put in place in a proper way, maybe to mirror part of the American system. Not that Americans do everything right. They don't. But this law in particular does. And the only way you're going to really get to the core of the problem is to have whistleblowers exposing this and really whistleblowers. Uh, the best way to think of it are an extension of law enforcement. And if you, if you actually see something that's wrong and you do nothing about it, you're actually complicit, meaning um, silence is complicity. And I think that's what people have to understand. Uh, whether it's a small crime in your neighborhood or it's a massive corporate crime that you witness, whether um, working in your native country, say Norway, or outside of Norway, for that matter. So I've always been keen to come to Norway. Uh, I've talked to some of the people in your uh, judiciary departments about setting up whistleblowing policies, not just on the corporate level, but on the government level. I think it's just like your health care and your educational system there in the country. It's uh, one of the top in the world uh, to have them. But certainly whistleblowing should be also a part of these ethical format, if you will, because uh, to get an education, to have good health care, but also to have a strong whistleblowing um, policy and law, um, that helps all Norwegians. And I think it's important for that to be uh, put in place properly. Right. Thank you so much, uh, Bradley, for that uh, presentation. That was very interesting. We're going to talk more about um, some of the points you made afterwards. But first, um, I would like to move to Iceland and another man who blew the whistle, Mr. Johannes Stefansson. Yes, hi. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> We're so happy to have you. You are maybe in uh, Reykjavik, I believe. Yes, I'm in Reykjavik in Iceland, and uh, it's a great pleasure to, to have the opportunity to participate. Thank you. We're very happy that you're here. So uh, just to uh, um, tell a little bit about you, you used to be a fisherman, uh, and then you became a CEO in Iceland's biggest fishing company, Samhari. You yeah. leaked 30,000 doc. Sorry. Yeah, sorry, I became a managing director of the Namibian operation. Yes, right. You leaked 30,000 documents to WikiLeaks showing how the company paid bribes to politicians in Namibia to access fishing quotas in the country. And this leak is known as the fish rod files and is the biggest corruption scandal in Iceland. So, Johannes, please uh, go ahead with your story. Thank you. I will put up the presentation. You see the presentation? Yes, we see it. OK. 
Okay. Yeah, good morning, all, and thank you for the opportunity. Uh, my name is Johan Estemoson. I'm the whistleblower in the face of corruption. Um, I will just go a little bit over the agenda points. Uh, just a brief summary of the face of cases where it stands today. The importance of whistleblowers exposing white collar crimes and corruption. And the metal, met, uh, methodology uh, for the white collar crimes and corruption in the face road. On the photos on the right side, we see the, the fish road suspects, which are called the sharks on the, on the top photo. And uh, they have been uh, all in jail since November last year, since the story broke out. And then the six employees of uh, the current and former employees of uh, somebody who have the status of suspects. Uh, just a brief summary. Uh, summary is the estimated turnover in Ambia from 2012 to 2019 is around 450 to 500 million US dollar, and they claim of loss of uh, 7 million US dollar for this period. The Financial Intelligence Unit reported around uh, uh, 650 million US dollar in flagged, uh, which they flagged as suspicious transactions related to fish road. They have also forfeited vessel, uh, bank accounts, assets, cars, and other. There is uh, one thing very remarkable with, uh, in Namibia is that the investigators and prosecutors in Namibia have been doing a very good and brave work and definitely are putting the standards, uh, standards of the investigation on cases like this much higher. They estimated several hundreds of millions of US dollars which the, the fish rod suspects have benefited. Uh, the biggest players in the fish route are, uh, are Samari and the Sharks, but there are also other related uh, corruption schemes around the fish route. Uh, the importance of whistleblower, I mean, as, as, as I see then, then it's uh, for the inside information, the whistleblowers can uh, bring a lot of uh, documents which uh, assist and, and uh, help with the investigation as the memos, emails, agreements, invoices, bank statements, and other important documents, which, uh, which I did uh, in, the, in the official cases. They can explain how the schemes work, which is very important for the, to, to know and understand uh, the schemes. Uh, they often have the know-how of the corruption as been part of it, as in my case, I was part of the corruption. And uh, who is who in the corruption schemes, and then uh, often in, uh, assist with the investigation and the prosecution. And also what is very crucial is that to inform the public. The public has all the rights to know what, what is happening. Um, what, what we have also seen as like in the visibles in USA, they play one of the biggest roles to expose corruption and uh, white collar crimes, which is quite admirable. And, and uh, as maybe Bradley said, you know, USA has, are doing a lot of good and right things uh, for, for the whistleblowers. Just a little bit brief, here is the Samhari's fishing quotas in, uh, in Namibia. And just pay attention to the blue pillars how it uh, start to grow. This is the corrupt quotas. I'll start to grow in 2016, 17, 18, a little bit reduced in 2019. Uh, this is quite big, big uh, and significant numbers. It shows how uh, they got in and then uh, developed from there. Uh, summer is turnover per year. And it's the same there as uh, pay attention to the blue pillars how we uh, start to grow, what I call the corrupt businesses. This is where they do a lot of tax evasions, they pay bribes and etc. How it grew from 2016 to 2018, a little bit reduced in 2019. Uh, the, the methodology, for example, with the bribe payments, this is mostly paid in the consulting fee or uh, rent and, and other similar ways. I just put the example of an invoice from one of the sharks, which are, are, the, are the official suspects in Nambia, and uh, invoice which was paid from one of the summaries company in, in Namibia. Uh, the bribe payments are paid both uh, from the banks in Namibia and also outside of Namibia, and uh, from a Cyprus company with a DNB bank account to Dubai, and also to Namibia from DNB. Here is an example of, uh, of an invoice which was uh, paid, that is uh, 
from uh, it was paid from the uh, DNB bank, it, uh, it was a uh, bank account owned by the Cy Samari Cyprus company to uh, the Sharks bank account in, in Dubai. There was not much paid in cash, but it was mostly then delivered in sport bags. <clears throat> uh, further with the methodology, then uh, Samari did everything they could to avoid uh, paying taxes at all costs. They sell to their own uh, Cyprus uh, companies, uh, create a big commission, like in 2012, for example, they took 10, 20, 10 to 20 percent sales commission. So they have moved the profit from uh, Namibia, just in this case, 10 or 20 percent of, uh, of their total uh, turnover over to, to Cyprus. And uh, there is no stuff for anything in, in Cyprus. It's just a shell company, you can say. <clears throat> Further with, uh, with uh, how they avoid uh, taxes is, uh, for example, inflated cost paid from the Namibia to companies of summary in, in Europe, for example. Uh, for example, the charter fee the, is the use of the vessel, and uh, the inflated cost was up to 1 million US dollars per month. And uh, in this case here is uh, to the company of summary in uh, Poland, named Atlantex. And they also have a bank account in DNB or had a bank account in DNB. Uh, on the right side uh, is the document with the transfer request to DNB bank, and uh, below uh, is the uh, is the invoice which Atlantic sent to, to Namibia. Uh, and uh, this uh, this is uh, quite significant numbers, which uh, which they moved uh, funds from Namibia. To, to, to their uh, companies in Europe and etc. Uh, then is, uh, for example, with the royalty fee payments, they established a company in Mauritius. So um, they paid royalty fee payments to Mauritius because there's a double tax treatment between Mauritius and Namibia, but um, they do this on the ground that uh, they have the know-how management and stuff and order in Mauritius, but it's just a shell company. Shell company. And, uh, and uh, on the right side is a transfer request, but below is just a clause in agreement to, which was uh, delivered to the Bank of Namibia to be able to transfer the funds out. And there it says uh, management experience, good management team, including staff, salespeople, directors and others. As they say to the Bank of Namibia, they have that in Mauritius, but there is nothing. Uh, then there are other, other ways which they have uh, wanted uh, to pay taxes. For example, uh, they was booked in a service fee for a Samaritan company in UK, license fee also uh, to, to the company in UK and uh, owned by Samaritan. And uh, this is how they do it in the books in Namibia to reduce the taxability. Uh, then they also, the one way is to create uh, loss in one company to receive profit from another because they maybe use their own company in Namibia, which uh, they have full control and they, <laughs> they put as much cost on that company so it's in loss. So another company they had maybe in cooperation with the Namibians they took the profit into the loss company. And then this is a very classic one is the loan. And then they channeled interest payments out from Namibia. And uh, one of the bigger, uh, bigger, uh, <coughs> bigger crimes is also that uh, there is a Forex uh, regulations in, in Namibia. So you have to, you have to uh, return all the, all the current, all the sales, you have to return all the funds back for the export sales, which Samari did not, and I had a lot of problems with them at that, uh, when I was there, to get them to return all the funds back because there is a regulations in place, and this can be a significant numbers, and mostly it was uh, done with the Cyprus companies with uh, bank accounts in DNB, and then there are other methods. Uh, <clears throat> Regarding uh, the Cyprus and DNP, then uh, Cyprus has a bad reputation and, uh, and for corruption, and as we recently seen in the Cyprus papers, which was, uh, which was reported by Al Jazeera, where they, they sell passports to whoever wants to buy passports as long as they pay. 
And uh, in, uh, in Samaris case that uh, used a lot of Cyprus companies, but they all had bank accounts in DNB. So uh, Cyprus is very popular to be used for those who are doing white collar crimes because it's also an EU country and, uh, and uh, Cyprus has often been criticized not to have a, a strong and strict regulations in place to deal with the white collar crimes. Uh, as I said, then the DNP allows uh, Cyprus companies to have a bank accounts. Uh, so, <coughs> so therefore the, the money gets into the reputable bank system. And uh, because the money is for a Cyprus company, but is in the bank in Norway, and uh, that gives them a quite good, uh, good uh, position for all the money laundering, because it, you have it in a Norwegian bank, and uh, and DNB is in Norway, and uh, Norway is one of the most reputable country. And uh, when you have when you have your money into the bank system is in Norway, you are in much better position because of the good reputation of Norway. <clears throat> in uh, for the uh, for 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 DNB Bank, then we can expect there was been a significant numbers which has gone through DNB Bank in the fiscal cases, and we're probably talking about several hundreds of million US dollar, which uh, can big part of that can be pure money laundering, and uh, <clears throat> this is with the Samaris companies in uh, in uh, Cyprus, Poland, and possible other countries. And um, this will be very interesting to see how the DNB Bank will, uh, DNB Bank and the Financial Intelligence Unit in, in, in Norway will, will uh, deal with this and, and map it. As, uh, for example, the, the, the export sales uh, for the fish sold from uh, Namibia through Cyprus company, then uh, as I said the money is not uh, returned, often not returned back to Namibia, and that means that it goes through DNB. DNB Bank and further maybe for the investments of uh, Samaria in, in Europe, but it has become then a money laundering. Then uh, there are there bribe payments from a DNB Bank and uh, were paid from uh, yeah, DNB to Dubai and even to Namibia. And then it's not clear with the, with the, with the know your client uh, as uh, with the Cape Cod, which is registered in Marshall Islands, but to have connection to Cyprus. And uh, there are big numbers uh, which went uh, through through DNB Bank for these companies, for these companies. So I think uh, DNB has quite a quite challenging, uh, challenging uh, uh, task to map everything. And then there are other suspected crimes. And uh, I want maybe to say that, you know, the, the bribe payments with Samiri is expected to have paid to the sharks. These uh, numbers, uh, we will probably see it go up to 20 million US dollar and, 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 uh, and maybe more. And uh, at least 5 million was paid from uh, DNB Bank and the other mostly paid from uh, within Namibia. And then it's just a brief that uh, it has not come easy to come forward. And, and uh, I, thankfully, I have a good protection I've been having for the last years. And uh, these are some of my protectors, and they're all from DRC. And uh, to far right is uh, Christian Yeme, who have been standing with me all the time for the last four years. Uh, yeah, then I just say thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Johannes. That was also a very uh, uh, interesting uh, presentation. And Bradley, you are still with us from the US. Um, I would like to discuss with you both uh, some of the points that you made. Uh, first, let's talk about a little bit about the system. Um, in your presentation, Bradley, you uh, called I believe it was the banking industry a global criminal quartel. Why? That is correct. Um, well, here's the here's the problem. When I uh, commenced my whistleblowing, that was within the bank internally, which there's another big argument. Do people uh, report it internally or did they go externally to, say, the media or a government agency? Uh, the problem is this, is that, again, when I exposed this, this was 19,000 millionaires and billionaires from America having their monies in Switzerland. The problem that we have is not only was the bank not fined properly, but they were given a deferred prosecution agreement. So nobody else was indicted. 
The bank wasn't fined properly. And the U.S. government only got 4,700 names out of the 19,000. This shattered Swiss bank secrecy because it had never been done before. And as a result of that, many other um, countries, mainly European, went after Switzerland to have the automatic exchange of information uh, treaty put in place, which has been very effective. And recently, the French uh, were handed 40,000 French clients because the Swiss Supreme Court ordered it. But the problem is this, is why is it today that we're still talking about Panama Papers, LuxLeaks, FinCEN, some of the things we've been discussing here today, when in fact the ECB, the EU, the Federal Reserve, the IMF and the World Bank, why do we need all these banks if we're still having all of these massive scandals worldwide? What is the uh, problem with these institutions? And as I always say, you're either part of the problem or you're part of the solution. And I find it very troubling, the fact that this is still ongoing today in 2020. And in fact, I started my whistleblowing back in, well, to the government, at least in 2007. So that was 13 years ago. So this shouldn't come as a surprise. And I think it's very troubling that these major banks, both European and American, uh, haven't, haven't done their job. But to the general public, it can be quite difficult to really understand what is going on. Now, you have been in the valuable position as an insider. Can you tell us easily <laughs> how mm -hmm. the system works? You, you say it's a problem. What concretely is the problem? Well, there's many problems. And I think um, certainly I can just compare for, for your audience right now, Norway versus America, for instance. Norway is a very small country. America is a very big country. Norway has very high taxes. America has relatively lower taxes. Okay. And that's a very complex issue. But let's just talk about the tax issue for a moment. The reason why people uh, feel compelled to hide money from the tax man or from a business partner or from a spouse is because they want anonymity, they want secrecy, and they want to be able to have a nest egg put somewhere. But I think we would all agree if the, um, the taxes were harmonized, certainly within the EU, um, why should income tax or capital gains tax or wealth tax or VAT be different? If it's a union, it should be the same all across. That would be a big deterrent from having an offshore center. That's one aspect. Certainly, as we discussed here with the fish rod here, that's, that's pure bribery and, ex and extortion and uh, uh, kickbacks and so forth. But the problem here is, is that first, harmonization of taxes, that's very important because once that's done, it gets the incentive of trying to cheat out of the way, mostly. Secondly, you have to have greater enforcement. The enforcement is really lacking, whether they're under budgeted, understaffed, they need more sophisticated uh, law enforcement professionals who know these types of tactics and what people do to hide money or uh, to do these nefarious things. The third thing is, of course, as I said earlier, is having stronger whistleblowing policies so people are attracted to come forward to do the right thing and clean up society. That's very interesting. Uh, but I also would like to know, how does this problem look from within the inside, within the banks? What, how does the system work so that we see all these scandals again and again and again? What is really the problem inside the banks? Well, you have, you have a very uh, weak compliance department and legal department. That's the first problem. Uh, certainly, um, if you look um, with my situation with UBS, of course, I, I detail it on my website, lucifersbanker.com, and I've written a book about it. But it shows countless fines over the years where the bank has been paying fines in Germany, in Italy, in America, in Canada, in Japan. And you must ask yourself, why do they continually get fined and they're still in business. Nobody goes to jail. Uh, the bank gets, writes a check and walks away. And the problem with that is, is that this is condoned. And that's why the Department of Justice in America, for instance, is, is failing to do their job properly. The problem comes into uh, cronyism and nepotism, where they're very close between the government employees and the law firms in America. It's a big business. And it's corrupt. It's very corrupt. It, it seems very hard for people to understand how a bank could be breaking securities and tax laws for decades, 
in the hundreds of millions and not be indicted. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, it really makes no sense. So that precedent, and it's a very bad one, incentivizes banks to say, well, we'll just do it again. All we have to do is pay some money and we'll just continue to break the law. And that's what we've seen over the last decade, as I highlighted, all these other cases that are uh, quite troubling. And I think this is really what has to be done is uh, stricter law enforcement, jail time, and, uh, and losing a bank license possibly for, say, several months or even years if it's flagrant. Hmm. Johannes, uh, I would like to ask you, because you have now just described in detail how the company Samheri operated uh, in Namibia. Uh, you were the managing director in Namibia. You were actually... Uh, processing this tax fraud and the corruption. Um, I mean, the simple question would be, why did you do it? And did you uh, understand that you were doing something wrong? How did you look at your own operation at the time? Yeah, I I think, you know, it's... um... Hey, you see, it, it starts small, but, uh, you know, with the tax avoidance, uh, they are always uh, claiming they're some kind of victims, that they are suffering and so on, and you're working for this big company and you want to try to do well and etc. But of course, there are bells ringing in my head you know, when it's happening. And uh, just also pay attention that, you know, with uh, the corruption and the uh, white collar crimes increased a lot after I, I, I left. And, uh, and, uh, but uh, there is a bell ringing and, you know, you are like, okay, this is just how the people do it. And, you know, and that's why I have said that uh, I started in Nambia 2012, but from 2014, I start to suspect, you know, okay, this is uh, not, not, not the right thing and, and et cetera. And it's also a process just to, after I left, to understand what I actually had been part of. I mean, I'm not the mastermind in this or anything like that. I just uh, did uh, what was uh, asked uh, from from me, and uh, and uh, it it starts small and it grows and it grows and you get somehow what just adopted to the environment. And uh, and uh, but uh, as I say, you know, it was a big process just to, after I left in mid uh, 2016 to understand what I had actually been part of. And what it was part of to create, because uh, it became much bigger after after I left. But um, there are like with the tax avoidance and so on. Then you're always feeling that the the, the Icelandic fishing company Samari is just suffering, and they are always you know they are doing so much for everybody. They deserve to do more, and you are dragged into this mentality. Mm-hmm. Uh, but how, I mean, as you know, your your former boss is, is calling you a liar, uh, not surprisingly, but still. Um, how Was it something that you felt obligated to do, or do you have concrete documents showing that you were ordered to carry out these operations? I mean, uh, I had to come forward because I owe it to the Namibian people, and, uh, and I was not going to live with this on my, my shoulders. And uh, that's why I came forward. There, there is a quite good uh, trail of, of uh, documents which shows that they are very much involved in this from uh, from the start, of course. And uh, there are emails from uh, some of the financial people of Samari explaining, you know, we should go this route and this route for the to avoid taxes. Uh, and uh, that is quite a concrete uh, history on, on my docu- documentation, which I, I published, which was published on WikiLeaks. Uh, for the for the private payments, then I, I was also also careful that I was not writing it. You know, you don't send email. I need to bribe this and this one, but you put it into a different document uh, documentation, and you maybe name it something else. And this is uh, was with uh, with with all the shared with the, with the owners and and so on. And also keep in mind that uh, I, companies I manage is maybe there is maybe twenty percent uh, bribe payments from these companies. Because uh, some of the companies, like in uh, Cyprus, uh, they I have no control over these companies. So, uh, so you know, the case that is what maybe is good with the case is that it's very clear that you know I'm only small. I paid only a, uh, I'm only responsible for the companies who paid small portion of the bribes. 
Right. Uh, Bradley, what do you think about uh, what uh, Johannes is telling? I mean, the, like on a psychological level, uh, what makes you want to be a whistleblower when you're part of a system, you're actually part of a culture where everything is explained or excused? I mean, how do you actually come forward and say, I don't want to do this anymore? I mean, it seems like a difficult task. Well, It is. It's a very difficult task. And I think people have to understand that uh, sometimes the culture and the, uh, the recurring uh, attitude over months and even years um, sort of brainwashes people. So they feel as though, you know, well, my colleagues are doing it. I'll do it. It's just the way the company's operating, which isn't a, a proper excuse, but certainly it gives some sort of sense of what's going on. The other problem is, quite frankly, in my situation at UBS, I was a foreigner, of course, they are working in Switzerland, and most of my colleagues were Swiss. So you can imagine um, Swiss banking was treasured. I mean, this was really the golden um, beacon for the country. It, it raised a lot of money. It gave a lot of jobs. It helped for tourism and so on and so forth. So the ripple effect was quite dramatic. But the problem was, was that sometimes people were very um, reluctant to come forward because they felt as though, well, that was all right. Switzerland can do what they want. Unfortunately, there's other laws in this world and they were not abiding by them. So I think sometimes there's that culture there. Sometimes the money is so great that some people get uh, blinded, if you will, by the amount of money you're being paid or that you're operating in. Um, you might be part of the crime, of course, uh, which is even more serious. And that's where my problem was, where I came forward, where it was so blatant with this three-page document on our intranet, which literally contradicted what the bank was telling us to do and hadn't told us about this document or trained us on it. So I felt, uh, like Johannes, uh, this is very important to... It was a ethical obligation, number one, not just for me, but as I said before, for my clients... Uh, for the shareholders, my colleagues, because if you don't do something, uh, then and you know it's wrong, then you become part of that problem. Um, and I think that's where we have to change the attitude. Certainly whistleblowing is something to incentivize people, to say, don't be afraid to come forward. Come forward and report it. Certainly, if you report it early, you might stop a lot of other pain later down the road as well. Mm. Johannes, how did you consider your options at the time? What made you come forward? What was it like tipped you in this direction? Um, first, I, I want to say something. I agree with a lot of what Bradley is saying, you know, with the culture and so on. And also that, uh, that uh, you know, I started to realize I was working for an uh, organized crime syndicate. These white collar crimes are nothing else. Really? They are stealing from the people left and right. You know, this has, has a huge negative impact on the on the Namibian society. And uh, and uh, so you know that was uh, the, the the process with with this and and come forward. I mean, uh, this is uh, something uh, I was not gonna go f forward in my life with, with and knowing what I've been part of. Uh, And uh, that, that is, uh, yeah, I mean, you look at the Namibian society, you see how they are suffering and, and, uh, and this is uh, no way I could do that. And also, like I say, I mean, start to realize I was working with the organ uh, organized crime syndicate. Yeah, because you were actually seeing the concrete consequences for the Namibian society. Yes, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, that, that played a quite, quite big role because it's a kind of wake up call also. And because, I mean, uh, I want the best for the Nambi and I came there to build up. But uh, from 2014, I realized somebody was not going to do anything. It was just empty promises to get access to the resources, to benefit as much as they could. And they would get in there in any way. So, uh, yeah. So, uh, and, and, uh, and uh, then also there the, somebody had Nambian partners there with another company. And uh, they were going to cheat and steal from them. And... And uh, that also was not acceptable from, from my side. What about you, Bradley? What kind of consequences did you see of this criminal activity? Well, uh, my case was quite uh, unprecedented because no one in history had ever come forward to report uh, this offshore uh, illegal operation. 
So uh, number one, what had happened, um, actually on my website, it's quite uh, well detailed uh, under author and the impact that I had. But in essence, the entire management team, uh, the executive management team of UBS was fired. The bank was fined $780 million, which was really a, an underpayment that should have been much greater. And then, of course, um, uh, three amnesty programs were put in place in America, which we had 19,000 clients. And as of four years ago, the IRS reported over 100,000 Americans became tax compliant. Why is that important? Because what that means is money leaves Switzerland and comes back to the American banking system and gets invested and taxed through perpetuity. So not only did you have a total transformation of an illegal business, but then other countries began to realize, hey, wait a minute, if America could do this, why can't uh, we actually do this? And just a few years ago, I actually testified in the French trial against UBS in Paris, where they got a verdict of 5.1 billion euros. It's under appeal now, but certainly I'll be attending the appeal next year. And that, that sent us very strong message that this will not be tolerated and that um, countries are going to hold UBS accountable and uh, the Swiss banking system. So mm. it's had an enormous effect. And I think certainly not just in changing the banking system, but also um, motivating was supposed to do the right thing and to come forward. I would like to talk to you a little bit about the uh, status of a whistleblower because you are both well-renowned whistleblowers, but your status is quite different. Bradley, you are a protected whistleblower, and Stefan, Johannes, you are not. Um, so, Bradley, I want to ask you first, what does it actually mean for your everyday life that you are a protected whistleblower? Well, I wasn't really protected, uh, unfortunately, because what had happened was there were conflicting um, agencies within U.S. government that really um, were fighting over this case. It was so dramatic and so large uh, and affected so many people. You can imagine 19,000 millionaires and billionaires, um, if they were rich in America and have the money to put in Switzerland, they were very rich. So the Department of Justice attacked me um, and indicted me, and I, I served two and a half years in prison. So, And I was the only one to go to prison. So you can see that this is very, very dramatic and it just shows how corrupted the system is because what they didn't want was have all the names uh, exposed. And hence why I wrote a book about this subject, not to make money, but to tell my story and to tell it to people so they could understand not only how corrupt the justice system is in, in America, but how corrupt the US and uh, Swiss governments are at the time under the uh, Obama administration, because this is really serious and uh, I actually met with Julian Assange twice at the Ecuadorian embassy and spoke to him at length about this. And we had some very um, in-depth conversations with respect to the corruption of the Obama administration. Right. Um, and you were given a reward of $104 million for providing the information that you did. Uh, and you uh, argumented in your presentation that, you know, you should have an incentive. But do you see any downsides or problem with whistleblowers getting financial compensation for blowing the whistle? Not if it's implemented properly. And what it's very important for your audience to understand, the uh, money I got paid was from the crime I exposed. It does not come from the taxpayer. It comes directly from the crime that's exposed. So without the whistleblower, you never would have been able to see the crime. That's the first thing. The second thing, it's only a small percentage of the total amount. So really, the government is gaining tremendously. It's probably the best investment they'll ever make is they're paying pennies on the dollar, as we say here, vis-a-vis, -vis, um, you know, letting this business to continue. And really, you have to remember what has happened as a result of my whistleblowing. Not only did this business get closed down and the money uh, was returned to America, but people were fined and given penalties and so forth. But that money comes back into the U.S. banking system, as I said, gets invested in tax through perpetuity. That's hundreds of billions of dollars we're talking about just in one market. The second thing is, is that it also sends a message to other whistleblowers, say, this system works. 
it works for people to come forward because as I said before, some people are scared, they're intimidated, they may get fired or even uh, be harmed physically. Mm -hmm. So what really needs to be done is the whistleblowing policies and laws that are put in place have parameters. For instance, it has to be over a million dollars minimum. It's not maybe a boyfriend, girlfriend fighting over uh, ex exes saying, you know, they did this or they did that. This is serious crimes that are affecting a large amounts of people in society. The second thing is you have to come in with truthful and accurate information. You can't just start making up stories because you're vindictive or what have you. And third, the, um, the cases are investigated thoroughly. And what happens is, is if it's really um, concrete and accurate, then what happens in an investigation takes place and then a criminal prosecution possibly takes place. And then the proceeds of that crime get paid out to the whistleblower. So mm -hmm. you can see the government wins, the whistleblower wins, and the bad people get exposed. Uh, I want to ask you, Johannes, uh, what do you think about I mean, you haven't received any reward. You have received threats, right? That's what you have received, basically. Uh, what kind of protection uh, does a whistleblower have in Iceland? Uh, in, in Iceland, uh, there is no whistleblower protection, and I think there was just uh, now recently the law uh, agreed upon, uh, which will uh, uh, will be implemented early next year. And uh, at least it's a good step, but it doesn't apply to me. And and in uh, in Namibia, uh, the whistleblower protection law has not been uh, have not been implemented. But uh, there is some witness protection law, but uh, we are more. On, on, on the or the investigators and prosecutors are working on this as well, and um, in in my case, maybe the biggest challenge is that you know they were gonna. I came forward two years after I left Samaria, and during these two years, they those uh, at least uh, some of the suspects or uh, associates they tried to silence me several times, and uh, I've been having on two occasions so up to 30, 13 bodyguards, and I've been alleged poisoned and so on. So. Uh, there is also clear, it's, it's very clear they were going to silence me before I had the opportunity to, to come forward. So maybe the physical uh, protection is quite uh, a priority. And, and uh, I get information that, you know, that uh, they, I'm not, um, <clears throat> people prefer that I would not be on this earth anymore. So uh, there is going to be a challenges with the law in, 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 in Namibia when I have to go and testify, and, uh, but we will see and deal with that when it comes to it. In Iceland, you know, I mean, uh, I don't have a big belief in the system in Iceland. I think Iceland is way back in, uh, to deal with white collar crimes and, uh, and, and corruption. And uh, I think Iceland really needs to step up uh, on all these matters. And, uh, you know, I came forward also in Iceland and I had the status of the suspect and, you know, I just have to deal with the consequences as they come, if I go to prison here or not, it just uh, time will tell. But are you afraid? And, no, I a long time ago adopted to this, uh, this, uh, this life and, and, and uh, you know, this is just, I mean, thankfully I have a good protectors with me who have been with me all the time and they do it because they believe in what I'm doing and want to see changes to the better for the Namibian people and hopefully it will lead to a uh, good example to other African country, countries. And uh, it's just a way of, uh, of living, you know, you, I take my steps very carefully and uh, stay low profile. And when I travel, I normally have to have a protectors and uh, we, we just do it very professionally. I have a, the protectors who are with me are very professional and trained and learned uh, bodyguards. And, and we have gone through a big obstacles uh, before we, I came forward. So, so we, we, I think we are. We, 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 we know we are against superpowers, but uh, it's a way of living. Okay, that's uh, that's good to hear that you're optimistic. Okay. Uh, you both made some some really uh, valuable points, um, and we really understand the uh, the importance of ensuring the protection of whistleblowers in order to obtain this information. That basically you are the only one who can can put it out there. Uh, I would like to open up for questions. We have a panel and I see there are things going on in the chat. I really haven't had the time to read all of it, but please just uh, come forward if you would like to ask either Bradley or Johannes uh, some questions. I'd just like to add one thing to what Johannes said there. Yes. This, is, this is absolutely a prime example of why whistleblowing laws must be put in place 
in Johannes' situation, certainly, uh, you can see now he is um, he's fearful for his life at the beginning. He has bodyguards and so forth. Um, think about the economic and emotional strain that he must endure. And that's why paying a whistleblower can actually help compensate him to possibly give up his job, to actually maybe support him himself and his family, whatever it might be, pay legal costs, pay security costs. This is exactly why the laws must be passed because that, that certain uh, situation demands it. But that should, that's why it should be across the board. Everyone should have protections as well as um, compensation for doing the right thing. That's very interesting. And we're going to talk more about that in the next session as well. Any questions from the panel? Uh, yeah, I'll just jump in if that's okay. Uh, Nick Lord from the University of Manchester in the UK. First of all, let me say thank you to Brad and Johannes for sharing their stories. It's incredibly rare that we as researchers have the opportunity to speak with and hear from those from the ins inside who were actually involved in the organizing organization of these criminal activities. I just had a very quick question for Johannes because it was very interesting to me that he made reference to the involvement of UK registered companies as part of the tax avoidance schemes that he was involved in. Now, it's pretty well known that the UK is a central hub of illicit financial flows, while simultaneously seemingly being very effective in formal compliance. So we have a bit of a paradox occurring in the UK. And of course, the use of these corporate vehicles or anonymous shell companies and so on is a global issue. But for Johannes, I was curious to know what might have been a disincentive to use, say, UK-based corporate vehicles or corporate vehicles in offshore lake locations more broadly? You know, what can be done to reduce the misuse in these cases? Uh, in, in, in this case, you know, there was um, originally was a Samaris company in the UK, which was uh, the, the owner of the na first Namibian company. And uh, what I understood from the financial manager of Samari internationally is that uh, this UK company created a lot, was, cre was a lot of loss created in that company. So it was uh, a good opportunity to bring uh, money from Namibia to that company because in the whole system or whole corporation of Samari, which is in many countries, there are laws created in companies. So then you are, uh, then you then therefore they used the, the UK company to begin with, and later it was moved to Mauritius. Does it answer your question? Uh, well, I, I was wondering what, what do you think could be done? to reduce the yeah. misuse of these companies in these financial crime cases? Yeah, th this is a very good question. And, and, uh, and uh, I, I must say that I don't have your, uh, exactly the answer for you, but uh, I think it's uh, coming with, with more strict uh, law and regulations uh, based on, uh, on the money laundering uh, schemes and etc. That is the only answer I have for you. Um, I would add to uh, Johannes's answer there. I think what you must do is... Um, impose stiff penalties and fines and jail time. The moment you catch someone used in an offshore company, say in the UK, and they're using it for nefarious purposes and they get caught, and it can be proven that they knew what they were doing, obviously, you put them in jail for five years and fine them a half a million pounds. And then you're going to have this whole situation stop. That's the only thing that people are going to recognize, that they're going to be prosecuted and they're going to be fined, and they're going to be fined very steeply. And other people can be put in jail as well. Whether it's a banking institution, put the CEO in jail for a year. I guarantee you this will stop immediately. And that's the, the problem with the justice system. They don't imply justice properly. They, um, they just uh, allow these people to get away with it because they're so well connected with the lobbyists, the law firms, and so forth. Uh can I, can I also add exactly, I, mean, I fully agree with Bradley because you know, also what we, we, we see here we see in, uh, in, uh, in Namibia is that uh, the, the suspect, fiscal suspect, have been in, in, uh, in uh, jail for almost one year due to the investigation, but we don't see any actions in Iceland. The message has to be very clear out. The investigators and prosecutors are going to deal with it, as Bradley rightfully say, because you know, the, these are serious crimes. They should uh, go in jail and be fined heavily. 
This is indeed a, a, a super interesting topic, and I, I'm afraid we would need like a, a new session on why is there no uh, jail punishment for for CEOs, for example. We have time for I think just one more question. If any other would like to, Tina. Uh, yes. Uh, well, I too think this was really useful to hear from from these whistleblowers, and I have to say that here in Norway we have a. Uh, where we have some uh, room for improvement and uh, an expert uh, committee suggested an, a specific ombudsman for whistleblowers and in parliament it nearly got uh, majority support but the current government decided uh, not to, to, to go for it and it's obvious that some sort of compensation is necessary uh, but also safety and uh, job state and the status and so on for whistleblowers are extremely important and i was wondering if not also journalists have a role to play in terms of 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 developing a culture where whistleblowers feel that it is safe to to speak out because um they are heroes in, in a, and and they and very often this uh skepticism about their motivation and this um, and and the problem is not only safety and money but also the the status vis-a-vis -vis their friends and society in general so i was wondering how can we change the culture so that whistleblowers are are not only financially rewarded but also culturally and uh, socially uh, rewarded for speaking out and feel that this is something that they ought to that they will be compensated for also in society. That's very interesting. Would you like to comment on that, Bradley and Johannes? I would say that it, it, first it has to be acceptance. I mean, a lot of whistleblowers are treated, as we say here in America, the skunk at the picnic. Uh, and that's the wrong attitude. The attitude should be that they're there helping all of society to clean it up. So first, the acceptance is very, very important because it takes a lot of courage to come forward. You risk your livelihood, your reputation, possibly your family, your health in uh, Johannes's situation here. And that, that takes a, a tremendous strain emotionally, economically, time and so forth. So I think that's why these, the justice has to be implemented across the board and it has to be very stiff. Second, the laws have to be passed to protect and compensate the whistleblowers. And third, society has to come and support whistleblowing, get behind this initiative, because it's, it's for everyone. It's to eradicate it, whether it's in the pharmaceutical industry, finance, the fishing industry, construction, um, military contracts, whatever it might be. This is better for everyone. So that's where society must get behind whistleblowers and pass these laws. Thank you, Bradley. Johannes? Yeah, I fully agree with Bradley. And also what, what, what we, are, we, are, we are experiencing is that there is no political will. I mean, why have the law not been passed to protect whistleblowers and stand behind them, you know? There is no political will in Iceland, in my opinion. There is no political will in, Nam in, in Namibia. And, uh, and uh, the, the whistleblowers who are coming forward in those countries who, are not, uh, who have no protection, you know, I mean, uh, there is a, I've been now fighting for four years, even though I just came, uh, the story broke out almost one year ago. There is, uh, thankfully, we have the public with us in Iceland and Namibia, but there's a clearly no political will. And why is there no political will? It's a, it's a greater failure in, in, in the system. We're going to elaborate more on that. We're just going to have uh, one of the most renowned uh, lawyers representing whistleblowers in the next session. I'm afraid we're out of time. I would like to thank both Bradley and Johannes for your taking your time and sharing your stories. It was really interesting and it's important, I think, to spread Uh, and uh, and Johannes, uh, enjoy the day. And uh, of course, uh, stay around if you want to follow the rest of the conference. Thank you so much. Back to Muna. Thank you so much to Bradley and to Johannes for being with us. And thank you so much to Hegel. So this was very interesting to, to listen to. 
And I think that we uh, who are a part of this conference have a shared responsibility to uh, bring forward these concerns and uh, contribute to making whistleblower protection uh, laws stronger in our countries. We have now heard from two of the most renowned whistleblowers in some of the most significant recent cases share their stories and their concerns. And this is serious. It's a matter of life and death. Now, we'd like to hear from one of the most profiled lawyers in the world who share with us how he is working to protect whistleblowers. William Borden is, the, is a lawyer of the Paris Bar and an international engaged activist in the defense for human rights. He is known to represent whistleblowers like Edward Snowden, Antoine Deltour from the Lux League and many, many other high-profile whistleblowers. His main areas of activity is criminal law, uh, criminal business law, special criminal law, business law, lit litigation, uh, media law. He's He's also um, a frequent writer of articles on international criminal and civil justice, human rights issues, uh, both within France and globally. Today, he will talk about something very, very interesting with, with us, namely the Signal Network. This is a new whistleblower foundation who aims to advance the public interest by encouraging transparency, accountability, reporting and whistleblowing. So, <coughs> William Borden will be with us on a pre-recorded video, but he will be with us live after the interview for a interview with Herge Mo Eriksson. So now we'll play the recorded video from William Borden. Please. Okay. Mm -hmm. Hello, everybody. Um, apologies for my late. Uh, we have been very busy. I mean, uh, criminal case pending before the court in Paris. Covid case at the office. Um, so, uh, as perhaps you know, I've been and I'm still uh, the lawyer with all my team of prominent whistleblowers since many years. Uh, the French lawyer of Edward Snowden, um, who have not so much to do, and Apelli. Um, and, um, but I can say that he's in good shape, and he's fine. Uh, with the lawyer of Hervé Falciani, Italian-French citizen, um, broke the uh, bank, banking secret, and uh, who is well known as a whistleblower at the origin of Swiss leaks, which brought to criminal proceeding against uh, HSBC. A um, um, couple of people have been indicted by investigative judge in France, and, and um, this is brought uh, to a kind of plea bargain with financial prosecutor. Um, and um, also the lawyer of Antoine Deltour, of course, uh, very well known at the origin of LuxLeaks. Um, and Rui Pinto, Football Leaks, Football Under Leaks. Another prominent public civil servant in France. And uh, other guys all over the world. Some of them in the same situation uh, uh, as Ripinto. And perhaps uh, first uh, lesson uh, I can hold from, uh, from uh, my commitment for this whistleblower. One, there is a legal framework uh, which uh, is extremely useful and would be more and more useful for a whistleblower, European whistleblower, uh, when they have to deal with criminal prosecution and uh, when they are citizens of a country where uh, protection of whistleblower is not recognized. 
this legal framework uh, is extremely useful and uh, we can hope it will be consolidated in the next years. And when Delto has been acquitted, acquitted by Luxembourg court after being convicted twice because, of course, it was uh, the addition of the uh, exceptional impact of the leaks uh, on the European Commission, European institution, and of the mobilization of uh, European civil society. But certainly also because uh, the judge anticipate a possible censorship of the Human Rights European Court. Uh, we must keep in mind the fact that Antoine Deltour was indicted for many offenses, illegal infringement uh, in a comp computer system, uh, misuse of uh, information which were considered as stolen, uh, and of course, breach of various secrets, professional and banking secrets. And he has been acquitted because the court, uh, in respect of the jurisprudence of Strasbourg's court, uh, has been considered as uh, fulfilling all the criterion of the jurisprudence. You know this criterion. Uh, the exactitude of the information, the, the, the proof that he had no other choice than sharing the information with a journalist, no possible internal uh, avenue to, to deny the fact, uh, except to take the risk to be completely crushed down. Uh, a balance between the prejudice of uh, Price Waterhouse and the advantage for the general interest, reminding that Price Waterhouse at the end asked only for one euro, which of course was a kind of confession of the absence of prejudice. Uh, and good faith, disinterestment, uh, and important to say that it's, uh, uh, it's still uh, uh, a leverage and a shield for, for main whistleblower. Second lesson, which can be old, uh, of course we can see that more and more countries in their national regulation recognize whistleblower protection. Um, and of course everybody knows that the uh, value of the directive on the protection of person who report breach of union, union law adopted in October 2019, which spread uh, uh, the field of protection. Uh, but there are many countries for the moment who did not recognize any kind of protection of whistleblowers. This is the case of Portugal. This is a difficulty, of course, for, for, for rip into defense, whom trial is still pending and uh, have been there of weeks ago, we can expect uh, a judgment before the end of the year. Now, and this is the example of the paradox in which whistleblowers can be can be put. He's in, he, has, he has been indicted, he's in risk to be convicted, and he appeared before the court with uh, how do you say that, anti bullet gilet uh, pare-balles. Uh, uh, and he integrated uh, protected uh, witness program. Uh, so he's in, like Janus. In one hand, he's recognized as a main contributor for criminal inquiries, protected 24-24 hours, and he's in risk to be to be to be convicted. Uh, but of course, uh, the. Uh, the lesson which can be old of Ripinto leaks are the following. Uh, there will be a new frontier. This new frontier uh, 
has been already a little explored by the uh, European Union directive. Uh, it has been also explored by the Parliamentary Assembly of European Council adopted in October 2019. Uh, it could be more or less uh, considered by uh, French MPs who are thinking to improve and enlarge the protection of whistleblowers in France. This new frontier is the following. To what extent we should consider that uh, whistleblower protection should be enlarged uh, to citizens uh, who, uh, um, who, by their initiative, reveal information of public interest out of the blue, without any uh, labor relationship, public or private. Uh, and we have to deal with a main contradiction. Uh, it would be masochist, irrational, stupid to encourage all the citizens of the world uh, at night when they navigate on their computer uh, to consider that they could feel entitled to, uh, to post anything which uh, arm them or upset them. In the other hand, because it could be a risk of vendetta, it could be a risk of, as we know it already, of uh, main damage for uh, reputation, integrity, and private life. In the other hand, my, in my assessment, we have to continue that this new generation of whistleblower, as we Pinto, as a kind of cousin John Doe is nicknamed Panama Papers, uh, have to be and will be and should be protected uh, if we uh, impose to this universal whistleblower uh, a, a great intensity in their good face, a kind of purity in their good face. And second, the demonstration that what they, really, what they reveal uh, can be considered as a main, main, main threat against uh, public interest. It, it, it should be at a magnitude of threat and, and importance and gravity exceptional. Uh, this is the second lesson I wanted to share with you. It will be extremely difficult. And there will be a lot of resistance, obstacles. Uh, and this is my third point. Uh, we have to deal now with a kind of ideological offensive in France and many countries. Of course, coming from the fact that populism, like a plague, like a curse, seems to diffuse their uh, awful ideology uh, in more and more countries, not only in Europe, but in, in, uh, in the world. Second, because uh, uh, there are some lobbies in Brussels, Washington, Paris, uh, which uh, who, uh, uh, who, with good reason, consider that their whistleblower are their worst enemies. And these guys, with lobbies, companies, private sector, but some states also, do not accept the risk for them, uh, that is to say, uh, termination of their impunity. And that's why they continue and they will continue to try to uh, obtain from the European Commission, from various countries, to criminalize violation of banking, banking and business secret. They already succeed, but not completely because uh, the law which has been which uh, has been enact, enacted in France in compliance with the European directive limited uh, the, the negative effect uh, of the directive 
uh, which uh, itself has been limited thanks to the mobilization of media, journalists, and geo. But uh, what is at stake today and what will be at stake tomorrow is the fact that all this underground world uh, do not accept the protection of whistleblower. I will never accept them. Uh, so we, we, we have to continue to mobilize ourselves to very professionally, without any angelism, uh, anticipate to this counter-offensive. And fourth lesson is the fact that, as you know, perhaps uh, I'm the founder president of PLAF, Platform of Protection of Whistleblower in Africa. Uh, I invite some of you, if you like, uh, to, to see our website, all the exceptional work we did for permanent whistleblower in Congo, which uh, brought us and my team to exfiltrate some of them. In Africa, you are in risk to be tortured, executed. Um, and the next frontier will be to expand the protection of whistleblower. Perhaps we will never see that, but in Hong Kong, in Dubai, in Singapore, in Latin America. Uh, and uh, my idea with you and other NGO uh, is to try to duplicate what we did in Africa, in, in Latin America. And considering the intensity of corruption of Latin America linked to the uh, COVID uh, pandemic, uh, many articles show at which point uh, more countries have to deal with crisis linked to terrorism, crisis linked to COVID, more kleptocrat, oligarch, uh, instrumentalized. The, 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 this double threat to continue in a complete impunity to accelerate uh, their corruption system, which uh, permit them to enrich themselves and to impoverish the population. So, next frontier will be one consolidate with some more protection in Europe, uh, impose the states uh, new provision to limit the risk of retaliation because there are still some uh, companies who, which will prefer to pay damages five or six years after firing the guy from a bank, a different one of them, uh, violating uh, whistleblower protection law and ready to pay some damages uh, some years, ago, years after. Uh, the scandal occurred by, 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 by the, 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 the leaks provoked by their, by their employee. And second is to universalize our protection of whistleblowers. This, of course, should bring one day to an inter international convention. Um, and uh, uh, we, we are in a crossroad time. Uh, whistleblower protection is a very modern contemporary uh, idea, very important to save our democracy of all the threats which uh, continue to weaken them. Uh, but simultaneously, the old world uh, will continue to try to uh, jam and, and, and disturb all our commitment for them. So thank you to everybody. Uh, I wish you a very good conference. Um, full regret not to be uh, in Oslo, as uh, many of you, and hope to see you soon. Good luck. Thank you to William Borden for being with us in this pre-recorded presentation. We should have had a um, interview with William Borden now, but the reality of, of working as a high-profile lawyer is that he is in a meeting. He was not able to be with us directly now. Uh, we will see if we can get hold of him after the next session. Therefore, we will move forward with session three in this conference, which is called Investigative Journalism Exposing Money Laundering. We tend to believe that money laundering is something which takes place far away. 
but it happens closer to us than we might think. We will now look at what investigative journalists have revealed about the role of the Nordic banks in money laundering and the importance of investigative journalism in exposing it. We are lucky to have with us three Nordic examples of excellent investigative reporting. And again, we are fortunate to have with us Hege Mo Eriksson to lead this session. Over to you, Hege. Thank you, Mona. Am I on? Yes, so as Muna said, uh, we're going to hear from the journalists themselves how they worked to reveal these huge scandals and what they did to dig through the secrecy of these cases. And we start in uh, Sweden. Last year, investigative journalists in Swedish television, SVT, aired a program about how billions of euros in black money was laundered through Swedbank. The stock fell over 25% following the scandal, and last year, the CEO and director of the board was forced to resign. Today, two of the journalists will share how they identified the powerful people behind the secret accounts. Linda Larsen Kakuli is a multiple award-winning computer journalist, and Axel Gord Humlesjö is an award-winning investigative reporter, both at SVT. They couldn't be with us live, but have recorded their presentation called Yanukovych, Manafort and Russian oligarchs. But first, a small teaser of what they will talk about. February 2014. Ukraine's President Viktor Yanukovych is emptying his palace of its riches. He's getting ready to make his getaway. <laughs> Meanwhile, in Independence Square, a few miles away, warlike scenes are being enacted. The popular uprising against the president, which has been going on for months, has turned into a massacre. <laughs> Forty-eight protesters are killed when police open fire in their attempt to clear the square. Four policemen also lose their lives. This marks the end of Viktor Yanukovych's time as president. It also marks the biggest theft in Ukraine's history. The treasury of Ukraine was fully emptied by Yanukovych and his crooks. The prosecutor general told that it was $30 billion. Politicians like Yanukovych and organized crime wouldn't be able to make off with this amount of assets without help. From banks that allow the billions to flow without asking questions. Paul Manafort was helping Yanukovych to whitewash his reputation in the West and to win elections in Ukraine. Man hittad betalningar som hade gjorts utav Yanukovyrs folk till olika personer, bland annat Paul Manafort, att han hade fått 12,7 miljoner dollar. How serious is it to mislead American authorities investigating money laundering? Now, well, here in the United States, if you lie to authorities, that's a felony. So I would view it as, as very serious. De politiska eh, röster som vi pratar med i USA eh, som får ta del av att ni inte har redovisat alla de här kopplingarna i Baltikum, de säger att detta kommer att få väldigt stora konsekvenser för banken. 
Vad tänker du kring det? Jag tänker att jag måste ju ta i det här direkt. Det är klart jag måste ju ta det här. Jag måste kolla upp det. Vi måste titta på om det finns mer än det här. Det här verkar ju inte... Kände du till det här? Nej. Kände du till den här amerikanska förfrågan? Så hörni, det har gått nu med råg i tio minuter. I think there are a lot of banks uh, that quite frankly have um, have a lot to be ashamed about uh, in terms of their conduct. Uh, and I think uh, they need to be taught a lesson, if you will, that there's a consequence. This is blood money, and anybody who thought that they could just uh, sort of profit a little bit and make a bit of money off of some bad guys has another thing coming. Sweden was not on our radar at all. It is perceived as totally uncorrupt country. And why do you think they let this happen? Because it's profitable. Hello uh, from Sweden, my name is Axel uh, at SVT. Hi, my name is Linda, also SVT. So we're gonna do, try to do this uh, pre-recorded from Stockholm. Uh, hopefully you have seen our uh, short uh, video intro from our documentary, Dirty Banking. And now we're gonna share a small presentation about how we did this investigation and focus on uh, some of the aspects of the uh, piece that we published in um, February 2019. Um, so let's see if it works. Here we go. So this is an image of uh, how uh, the stock market or the stock value of Swedbank changed um, after our program. Uh, when we published in February 2019, it was a shock to the financial market and to the Swedish public uh, because nobody had really believed that a Swedish bank could be involved in uh, such uh, behavior, laundering massive amounts of money for Russian oligarchs, organized crime and corrupt politicians. Um, and we're going to focus now on how we find some of this uh, how we found some of these key persons uh, behind the money laundering schemes, such as Ukrainian President Viktor Yanukovych, oligarch Iskander Mahmudov, and Trump lobbyist and campaign manager Paul Manafort. So um, maybe one uh, would think that when you receive uh, a huge amount of documents and data that it's pretty easy to sort of report that this is money laundering. But actually, it's a very, very complex issue, which you can see on this image, which is the, from the Magnitsky case. Uh, it describes how money from um, a large tax fraud in Russia was washed through several countries and banks around the world and finally ended up in uh, real estate in New York in the US. And uh, of course, uh, when you see this, you, under you can understand that it takes a lot of research and effort to sort of connect the dots and follow the money through the whole uh, washing system. Um, and for us, the big challenge was of course, um, structuring uh, and finding um, all the leads and this massive amount of information. We spent uh, many weeks. Um, we were a larger team, not only me and Axel, also our colleagues Joachim Divermark and Per Agerman were part of this work. Um, we worked a lot uh, with structuring and washing all the information so it could be in a format that we could analyze. Uh, and we worked also with the traditional sort of warning signs. We looked for um, clients that were shared the same addresses, um, uh, large amounts in round dollar amounts, uh, repetitive ma uh, manners, etc., and uh, ended up with a list of uh, top uh, suspects, so to speak. And when we had this database ready that Linda worked with uh, a lot, we um, started to do the classic research of who is behind specific companies. And 
the, the story of how we found Viktor Yanukovych in this material and could, and can connect him to a money, money laundering and bribe case was that uh, there was some articles in Ukrainian um, uh, on the Ukrainian website connecting him, Viktor Yanukovych, to a company called Vega Holdings Limited. And this was a you know shell company uh, that we didn't have any clue who was really behind, but it, and it was just kind of a rumor that Viktor Yanukovych could be connected to it. So what we had to do then was start to map up the whole structure uh, in uh, Yanukovych business sphere. Who did he work with? Who did he use as proxies for other companies? Uh, relatives, his son was a part of this scheme, and which companies could we connect to him? And in the end, there was a lot of uh, evidence supporting that Vega Holdings was uh, a part of his uh, offshore business strategy. Uh, but what was interesting with this specific case that really shows how money laundering works is that um, it was um, really well layered, uh, so to say. It was, um, we found in public records that there was a lot of different Vega Holdings uh, companies all over the world, in Gibraltar, in Cyprus, Ireland, Hong Kong, New Zealand, and Hong Kong. There was no way of knowing if all these companies were connected to Manafort or to Yanukovych, or if they just used a name that was similar to uh, companies that was registered all over the world. And so what we had to do, and, and yeah, I, I'm just going to add that this is a very common practice that you use general or generic names. So it will be as hard as possible to uh, really connect a specific company to a specific client when it comes to uh, crime investigations and, and so forth. And so what we had to do then was really to show and prove that this specific Vega Holdings company had this uh, account number that was uh, the same as in the uh, Yanukovych case. So th the method that we used was to uh, go on the ground to Ukraine and Kiev and uh, connect to our network with journalists in the country and they could go with our material from the database with this account number and this company name and search through uh, the crime records of uh, Ukraine. And in the end, then we were able to connect that this specific company in our database was uh, a part of a money laundering and bribe scheme in Ukraine. And that's how we could um, really prove that Viktor Yanukovych was a client and of Swedbank. Um, another technique that we used uh, was when we found the Russian oligarch Iskander Mahmudov, Linda. So um, Iskander Mahmudov is a very powerful and well-known Russian oligarch. Um, and um, this shows that some of the research uh, actually was uh, previously, we, we could take help from previous work from journalists because we could access the Panama Papers. We've been part of that investigation before. And just by searching for names and companies in the Panama Papers, we actually got lucky this time. Uh, we found his uh, passport copy. We found documents uh, showing that uh, he was actually the beneficial owner of a certain company that was a major client in, in Swedbank. Um, and through this, we could also start mapping out his whole structure because it, he, did just, he didn't only have one company in the bank. He had a huge amount of companies that were clients in the bank. And we could also see that he was a major, major client who transacted large amounts of money during this whole period. And I think just to add there that, that the key to this was really that we could connect uh, the new material about Swedbank to all the former uh, older databases that we had and by this was like a puzzle mm. putting this all together 
Um, and I think this is the key to our success in this case that we have been able for many years to build up these kind of databases. And it shows also how important the continuing work of journalists all around the world is and that we start or we keep sharing material with each other because eventually one time in the future someone else will probably need to rely on uh, information that maybe we have received so so it's sort of like a really big group work among journalists um, this also shows one of the other big stories that was uh, part of our investigation uh, we kept sort of mapping our material uh, against all other big uh, money laundering stories to see if we could find any connections and when it came to the Magnitsky affair, we found a lot of connections. Uh, that was a, a story that had been widely reported for many years. So in the public domain, there were a lot of information of what companies that had been used to transfer the money from Russia to the West. Uh, and what we found was that some of the core companies in this uh, affair, in the Magnitsky affair, were clients at Danske Bank in Estonia, and they had transferred money to several Swedbank uh, clients uh, in the Baltics. So this showed that this money was quite early uh, in the sort of transaction flow. It came into Danske Bank and then it flowed through Swedbank and continued away to other places. And so this is our next, let's see if we can see him here, uh, the next guy that we focused on, which was a big finding in the material, Paul Manafort, uh, a famous American lobbyist that worked together very closely with Donald Trump in the campaign of 2016 uh, presidential election in the US. And um, it was uh, through Yanukovych, of course, that we could find uh, Manafort. So it started with establishing that, Man that Yanukovych was a client of uh, Swedbank. And then by continuing to map up all transactions that we could connect to the Yanukovych network, uh, we were able in the end to find Manafort. And a very important part of this research was to use the uh, public database of court records in the US called PACER. Uh, because once again, many times to be able to uh, investigate these kind of money laundering stories, you need to put two different materials together. And uh, so we had our sweat bank material and now we started looking for uh, all traces of the Manafort uh, financial network in the public database. And, and we found then the Mueller investigation uh, about Russian interference in the, in the um, American election and the indictment against Paul Manafort. And in this specific um, case, in the ex exhibit list, we found a number of, of uh, companies, uh, which was Manafort's kind of global pocket in Cyprus, uh, from where he uh, uh, wired money all over the world when he was buying his luxury products. And uh, in this um, list of companies, we found in the end one company that had been doing businesses with uh, Vega Holdings. And uh, this is quite an interesting uh, topic in the end, because what Mueller really did in the trial was to show specific clothes that Manafort bought uh, in very expensive stores in the US. Uh, he used then offshore companies, especially in Cyprus, uh, to pay for all these uh, expensive clothing, like this python jacket or uh, ostrich west that he also uh, was very fond of. Uh, and the prosecutor was then able to really connect all the way down to purchases of clothes in the US back to um, his offshore networks that we then could connect to uh, Viktor Yanukovych, who paid him for political uh, campaigning as well. And uh, so I think we should send a great thank you to Paul Manafort because through him, we have really been able to 
tell the story uh, worldwide about why money laundering matters because he was really a, a key part of uh, these kind of political corrupt processes between dictators or corrupt politicians in the East and uh, money flows into the political world of uh, the West. So just to sum up, uh, we could say that our main method of finding these um, high-ranking people uh, in money laundering cases is just sort of taking the material and matching it across all kinds of sources that we could find, both open sources and other sources that we could access, uh, just sort of trying, trying, trying to match the, the, the material and then tracking down the money and the companies to be sure that we actually have the right people and we follow the money trail to the right place. And the key to this uh, work was to have an international network of journalists uh, all over the world. So when we found a trace in Cyprus, in Ukraine, we could reach out to our network and they could be on the ground trying to look for uh, documents that could connect to our database. And so that was our 15 minutes. Thank you very much. And uh, here you have our contacts if you like to ask us something or and talk to us about future stories. Sure. Anytime. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, uh, Linda Larson Kakuli and Ax Axel Humlersjö. Contacts are always useful. Uh, we now move to Denmark. Simon Benson is a Danish editor and a journalist with the newspaper Berlinske. Together with two colleagues, he exposed a money laundering scandal at Danske Bank, one of the biggest banking scandals in the history of Denmark. Their work has received several awards and last year they published the book Dirty Billions. The bank is now being investigated by authorities in several countries for channeling billions of dirty dollars. So Simon, welcome to you. The floor is yours. Simon, it seems like you have to unmute your, your microphone. We cannot hear you. Hello, everybody. Hi, there you are. Welcome. Yes, we can. Okay. Perfect. Uh, a pleasure to be here. I, I hope you can uh, see my, uh, my presentation. Uh, uh, I, I, we've been working on this uh, Danske Bank uh, money laundering story for since 2017. Um, last year we published this book uh, I showcase now, uh, which is called uh, "Biskitte Milliarder Danish Dirty Billions" in English, uh, which sums up the, our work and and and, uh, and and the story and the impact of the story uh, for us. Uh, the center of our, our story was the biggest uh, Danish uh, bank, uh, Danske Bank, which like uh, is uh, uh, is by far the, the the biggest and most in influential uh, bank in Denmark. Um, just to, just to sum up uh, what we're talking about in a, in a Danish perspective, uh, Danske Bank is an is an absolute pillar uh, in, in the Danish uh, society. It has uh, it's. It's more than 100, 150 years old and has, has uh, for, for, for many years been, been a central player in both the business but also politics and, and, and other parts of, of the Danish society. So, 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 so we're talking about and an, uh, an, an absolutely uh, the most powerful uh, financial institution in Denmark. Uh, these pictures uh, show... Uh, uh, Black and white picture show, shows the the, the older CEO of of uh, 
danske bank, which was called Landmannsbanken back in the days. It went bankrupt in the years following uh, the First World War and was saved by the Danish taxpayer, the biggest Danish company, AP Møller And and this has been the story of Danske Bank for uh, always. It has it, it is uh, well connected into the Danish society in in 2000 and, and um, 2008, following the financial crisis, these taxpayers once again had to to bail out the bank, so it, it didn't went bankrupt. So you cannot talk about uh, Danske Bank as just a, a commercial player, as just a bank. It's just it's more than that in Denmark. So so it's just to give you the the perspective, uh, the biggest picture here shows the the Norwegian uh, former CEO of of Danske Bank, Thomas Born, which was uh, fired uh, following the, the money laundering scandal in uh, in Danske Bank. Um, just to sum the case up, uh, the Danske Bank money laundering case uh, culminated in, uh, it's actually two years ago now, they had a press conference where they uh, published the result of a, of a big uh, uh, lawyer investigation of, of the whole money laundering scandal. This is our front page from the day after the uh, this press conference where Thomas Born uh, left the uh, left the post as CEO, the the chairman Ola Andersen also uh, left uh, his post shortly uh, shortly after. Uh, and just to sum up the the, the scale of this, uh, Danske Bank had uh, acquired the, the the Finnish bank Sampo Bank back in two thousand and six, uh, following the like the booming days of the in in, in, in the in the zeros uh, where, where Danske Bank. Uh, went above the borders of Denmark, went to Ireland, went to Finland, and then and 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 this was this uh, growth that led them to 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 get the the Estonian branch, uh, which was just like a, a, a followed the the acquisition of the the Finnish bank. Uh, from from two thousand and uh, two thousand and seven until two uh, twenty fifteen. Uh, uh, they had fifteen thousand suspicious uh, customers in the in the Estonian branch. Uh, they had transaction worth of uh, two hundred billion euro uh, via their non-resident customers. This was the the customers uh, who were the the who were the root of all these uh, problems because there there were no non-residents of Estonia, so they were often coming from from former Soviet republics and, uh, and namely Russia, of course. And and the lawyers uh, could not uh, confirm the extent uh, extent of actual money laundering uh, in these two hundred billion euros, but it was uh, a large part. Uh, and as I said, the the, the chairman and the CEOs uh, uh, stepped down from that from their post. Um, just to go back on how we work with this with this case. Uh, when I'm when I'm finished being a reporter, I, I would I would love to be uh, be the guy who who finds uh, names for 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 shady companies. Uh, I'm I'm a big fan of when we when we look through all these transactions, the the how how creative these people are uh, who finds out for these names for these shady companies. One of our favorites is this Worldman Sales uh, LLP. Um, it's a uh, you know, when you hear it, you think a big, uh, a big multinational company with uh, with offices in a place like this, uh, but but uh, it was nothing near near that. Uh, uh, the the real owners were, were hidden at, in in the seashells. Uh, um, oh, sorry. And the, and the and the and the director of the the company was a, was a proxy. Uh, this is the guy. His name was Ali Mulaya. He was a, he's an Iranian dentist who lives in, uh, in Brussels and is a, a well-known proxy. Uh, we also uh, the the accounts from the British uh, from the company's house in in Britain showed uh, very little activity, but we could see the bank statements from this company uh, were, that they were going millions through this account. So so the the, the these. Uh, this balance sheet from the company's house in in in, in the UK were, were up were, were false, and and the address of the companies was this uh, notorious uh, 
place for, for, for companies in Potter's Bar, uh, north of London, where uh, more than 2,000 other companies were, were listed. So this was, when we had to learn how to do this, this was like some of the uh, indicators we were looking for, uh, what, what was suspicious and what was not suspicious. Um, we started working on this by invitation from the from the OCCRP, uh, which invited us on a uh, back in I think January two thousand seventeen. We could look at some transactions uh, related to uh, a, a well known uh, money laundering case called the Russian laundromat, uh, which the the OCCRP had had uh, reported on. Uh, we uh, came into this and 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 and, and started working and uh, published the first stories in, in March 20, uh, 2017 concerning some 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 transactions going through the the Estonian branch of Danske Bank and and uh, uh, related to this uh, Russian uh, laundromat. But we had had no idea what we had started back in the days. We 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 thought that that we might do a, a few stories on this, and then we go back on, on reporting on other 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 cases. Um, but but we we uh, we tried to see if, if there were any more angles we uh, we could cover this, and 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 the account statements you see here was was our biggest breakthrough in this in this uh, this investigation. Uh, we received uh, these thousands of pages of account statements from four companies, uh, uh, in, uh, which were clients in the Estonian branch of Danske Bank. You can see here that this was uh, British uh, LP or LLP companies. They had address in in, in Baku, as the capital of Azerbaijan, um, and 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 uh, we also got the. These statements when you when you when you uh, open the account, uh, so we could see who had had had, uh, had opened the account. Uh, it was obviously proxies who who were signing these these papers. Um, but but uh, back in in 20, uh, 2017, we had no experience on how to investigate stuff like this. Uh, we had never uh, done anything like this before. Uh, and, and what could thousands of pages of bank statements from from four companies in, in, in the Estonian branch of a Danish bank with with obviously ties to Azerbaijan? What what could we do with this? Was was this was there some kind of story in this? We didn't know. Where this picture, we flew to uh, to Bucharest where we met with some of the brilliant guys from uh, uh, OCCRP, uh, which were ab absolutely crucial in helping us in understanding and, and researching and and and. and developing stories on this uh, on these statements uh, one example uh, this guy who filled in uh, for, for two of these four companies uh, it was this guy he lived in uh, in, uh, in Baku in Azerbaijan he was he used to be a driver for for employed by the International Bank of Azerbaijan uh, but he was obviously a proxy we, we had Journalists uh, approaching him in uh, in Baku, talking to him. He had no idea what was going on in these accounts. These two companies, he was registered as a, as a director from, uh, transferred uh, more than more than uh, two billion uh, euros during two years in the, in, in the Danske Bank uh, Estonian branch. So there's obviously that Danske Bank has has not. Uh, uh, Lift up to 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 the money laundering regulation. Um, it led to these stories, which were like uh, it's, it's it's three years ago now, but but this was like the, the crucial point of our investigation, because we could uh, document uh, not only what uh, that Den the Danske Bank was were were not uh, following the the money laundering regulation, but we could also. Uh, Two stories on what the consequence of this failure in Danske Bank was, and the consequence was that the the, the dictatorship of Azerbaijan used uh, the the Estonian branch of Danske Bank as a, a shadow bank to do all kinds of uh, illegal and, and uh, activities. They bribed European politicians. They uh, stole money from from the the people of Azerbaijan. They 
that did uh, all kinds of stuff with this uh, shadow account in, in the Estonian branch of Danske Bank. And it was also these stories in September tw- uh, 2017 who like started the uh, whole snowball of uh, because uh, it was it was these stories who made Danske Bank uh, hire an, uh, a big lawyer f- firm here in Copenhagen to investigate the whole Estonian branch. It was also with the when the FSA of of, of Denmark uh, uh, actively went in to investigate the case, so so this was the story, and this was the time who set off a, a whole series of of, uh, of incidents, who will, like would later culminate and are still ongoing, of course. Uh, we also did stories uh, that there were an internal whistleblower in uh, in Danske Bank who 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 already in in twenty thirteen. Were making uh, several whistleblower disclosures to the management in Copenhagen that there was something very wrong in uh, in in the Estonian branch. When we first read this, this we were amazed on, on on that they did not react to these warnings because, uh, as you can see here on the screen, they, he warned that uh, that. Uh, that the bank was working together with the Putin family and the FSB, the, the Russian security services, and and uh, uh, this was this was an amazing discovery for us. We and, and I think that's the first time we made a has, has made a front page at, at Berlingske, uh, which had a d- direct comment from uh, from President Putin. Uh, we did the story in. Uh, in February 2018, and and it was like when the interest and, and the attention to to this case exploded both in Denmark and uh, and abroad. Um, right now, the the Danske Bank's case is being investigated by the 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 police in Denmark, uh, by the police in, in in Estonia, and by the uh, Department of Justice in the U.S. Uh, among others. Uh, the most interesting here is uh, that that the anticipation is that that the Department of Justice in, in the U.S. will will issue a huge fine to Danske Bank, but we're still waiting uh, what what happens. Uh, I'm a big fan of this picture is from uh, last year when uh, when they dismantled the uh, Danske Bank was thrown out of Estonia, and and this is the picture when they dismantled the. Uh, the, the former branch of Danske Bank in, uh, in Estonia. Now Danske Bank has, has sold all its assets in Estonia and has left the country. Uh, I hope this, were, this was uh, useful for you. Uh, you can contact me by, by mail or by Twitter. Uh, and, and, and if you have any questions, uh, feel, feel free to do so. Thank you so much uh, for that, Simon. Um... It was absolutely useful, and we will discuss uh, some of your points further. You will stay with us, but first, uh, we previously heard the story of the whistleblower Johannes Stefansson in Iceland, and now we will hear from the journalist who covered this scandal, Ingi Viljalmsson. I'm sorry, Ingi, I have uh, practiced your name, but it's difficult. (laughs) Um, That's okay. You are an Icelandic journalist who works for a news magazine magazine called Stundin. Yes. In the November last year, you published a story about how the Icelandic fishing company Samherji paid bribes to politicians in Namibia to secure its access, access to fishing quotas. Today, you will share with us uh, also how the Norwegian bank DNB was used to channel $10 million in what is known as Namibia's most notorious corruption case. So, Ingi, welcome to you, and please go ahead. Thank you very much. I'm trying to share my slides with you here. Um, Okay. 
I just realized I didn't have my microphone on. I said, we cannot see your uh, introduction, but keep exactly. trying. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. I can't share my, my slides with you for some reason. That's okay. Take your time. Now we can see your screen. Now you can see my slides, right? Yeah, there we are. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Um, yeah, so... Um, <clears throat> um the 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 original story um uh, was published uh, in november um uh, last year and there was a co cooperation between um the media outlet that i work for called stunting and uh an icelandic tv program called uh, kveikur as well as al jazeera and we got um and we cooperated with um, the the whistleblowing site uh, wikileaks on the publication. Um, and on this photo, um, you can see the, the CEO of the fishing company, uh, Sam, Sam Heri, uh, with, the ministry, minister, with the former minister of fisheries in Namibia, uh, whose name is Bernhard Esau. And uh, the, the title of my present presentation is Gentlemen, We Are in Business. Um, how the Norwegian DNB Bank was used in Namibia's most notorious corruption case. And the reason why I, I selected this title is that um, this is a quote from uh, an email sent by one of the so-called sharks in Namibia who is uh, in custody right now, uh, suspected of taking bribes uh, and money laundering and uh, further, further crimes. Um, uh when when and, and he sent this email or this or this phrase in 2014 when it was when it when it became clear that um a joint venture company that was um that was uh, founded by the namibian state and the angolan state would be uh, getting the fishing permit from angola and this was this was important because this company, which was called Namgomar Pesca, was set up uh, like as a joint venture between uh, Namibia and Angola, just so that somebody could get the the, the quota al al allocation uh, that this company got, and then somebody paid um, millions of dollars to the the so-called sharks. Uh, to a company in Dubai, um, because because somebody got the quota and the scheme. So, uh, as Johannes talked about uh, earlier today in the conference, um, the gist of fish rot is that um, the, the the Icelandic fishing company Samhe paid many millions of dollars um, in consulting fees or bribes to a group of Namibian politicians uh, during from 2012 to 2019. And uh, in exchange, they got uh, horse mackerel quotas that are very valuable. So basically the, the politicians uh, and their business associates, they pocketed uh, money that should have gone to the Namibian state. Uh, what is spe specifically interesting about uh, this case, like in a, in a Scandinavian um, perspective, is that some of the money that the so-called sharks got from Samheri were transferred through, um, um, through the bank, bank accounts of uh, Samheri that Samheri had in the Norwegian bank, DNB. Um, and these were specifically, um, among other things, payments that Samheri paid to the so-called sharks in the in the uh, Namgomar deal that I mentioned earlier, which was this joint venture deal between Namibia and Angola. Uh, Samheri also used its bank accounts in DNB to transfer money to um, a, 
a company in the Marshall Islands, uh, which is a tax haven that is called Cape Cod. And, uh, and the money uh, that Cape Cod received from somebody was then used to, to pay the salaries of the, of the fishermen that somebody employed in Namibia. Uh, and the fish rod case, case is, now, is now being investigated in, in Iceland and Namibia and other countries. And uh, seven Namibians uh, have been in custody because of this case, suspected of, um, of bribes and money laundering uh, since November last year. And six Icelanders, um, current and former employees of Samiri, uh, have the legal status of sus suspects in Iceland um, because of this investigation. Now, what is most specific, it was very interesting for me as a journalist to uh, be able to participate in this publication, uh, among other things, because of the, all of the photographs that, um, that we got access to um, when we were working on the story. And here you have a, a photograph taken in Iceland in 2013, showing the CEO of Samirje and, uh, and three, uh, three of the Libyans who are now in custody, um, and two two persons from Angola, and this is the son of the this is the son of the um, of the uh, of the minister minister of fisheries in in Angola. Uh, and behind them, we see a trawler, um, an Icelandic trawler that belongs to somebody. Uh, now it, it was it was um, I was discussing earlier like the, the, the fact that somebody used um, used bank accounts in DMB uh, to in uh, to to channel some of the money to the uh, to the sharks and um, one of the things that happened in DMB in in two thousand and eight was that. Uh, the bank decided to to offboard the the company Cape Cod that somebody had used to pay the salaries of its um, of its fishermen in Namibia because it because the bank realized that it didn't really have any information about the like the ultimate beneficial owner of of Cape Cod, um, but the bank thought that uh, or had the information that. Um, that the company had been under Samheri um, for a while. Uh, so, in, so in the end, the bank didn't have like any any information about who the beneficial owner was, and the the, the bank uh, suspected that this might help facilitate uh, money laundering through the accounts of Cape Cod. So, and and while Cape Cod was the customer was a customer of DMB, the the, the company. Uh, transferred more than $70 million via its bank accounts uh, from 2011 to 2018 when the, when the bank's bank, ac bank accounts of the company were closed. Um, so, uh, yeah, so this was, um, and this was, and the bank said that this was against the, uh, like the know your client rules of, of the bank and therefore the, the bank took a decision to, to close uh, Cape Cod's bank accounts. And then it was very interesting that it, just prior to the publication of our stories um, last year, uh, the, the, the Cape Cod, this company in the Marshall Islands, was closed. Um, so it's not active anymore. And here you can see a, a diagram um, of like the the companies and the individuals involved in um, the fish rod case. And uh, here you have the Icelanders, Icelandic owners of, um, of Samiri, and you see like, the company net of, uh, of Samiri in Iceland. And, the, and here you see like some, some of the, uh, the bank accounts that, the, um, that Samiri had in DMB. And how, how uh, and you can see like, like how, how they are linked to uh, like payments to the Namibian, um, to the Namibian politicians and their associates, um, 
And, th and this, this, this diagram was, was done by um, my colleague, Alastair Kjartansson, who works for uh, Quake, the, the TV program Quake, Quake in Iceland. And it kind of it, it shows the complexity of like the all the companies involved and how everything kind of connects together. Uh, and after we published this sto this story last year, uh, DNB stock price took a dive, and um, and DNB took a decision to cancel its business relations with Samiri. Um, and this became public in in in, uh, in February. Samaria had then been a cli client of DMP since 2008, and the bank didn't like didn't specifically comment on why it cut off its business relations with Samaria, but uh, but the re representative of the bank said that um, that if it will be proven that the company has used the systems of DMP in criminal actions, it will of course have direct consequences on its client relationship with the bank. So we don't know specifically why DNB cut off its business relations with Samaria at this time, but it happened like directly after the publication of the story. Now here, here are like photos of some of the documents that uh, we had access to when we were working on the story. Here you have a document from uh, 2010 showing uh, from, from DNB Noor, as DNB was called at the time, Showing the 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 uh, showing like the 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 it shows like how Cape Cod um, uh, started doing uh, open bank accounts in in DMB Noor, and here you have the name of the 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 chief financial officer of Sambiri in the Canary Islands, who was the guy who. Who paid the salaries to the the fishermen who worked for Samiri in Africa? And here you have the you have a photo of the of the of the email that Saki Sangala sent in 2014 uh, when it became clear that the the joint venture between Namibia and Angola could was about to happen. And here you have you have an invoice from the company in Dubai that the sharks um, opened to. Receive payments uh, for the, the 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 quotas in the so-called Namgomar case, the joint venture between Angola and Namibia that I that I mentioned uh, earlier. Uh, and also, like in in the documents that we got access to, you had all kinds of like other types of sources. Like here, you have an, an invitation letter from the uh, secretary of the CEO of Samhiri to one of the so-called sharks, Tamson Hattu Kulipi. And the invitation was an invitation letter to attend an annual ball that, that the Icelandic fishing company has every year in, um, in the small town of Akulere on the north coast of Iceland, where the company has its um, headquarters. And on this photo, you can see Tamson here uh, and Saki Sangala on this annual, annual ball. So, so in the in the in the like prior to the publication, we had like we had access to bank documents and um, all kinds of contracts between Samiri and the so-called sharks, as well as documents like this that that show like show the relationship between Samiri and the the so-called sharks, uh, like on a on a more personal level. Um, now, of course, uh, I'm, I'm going to mention the obvious here, um, but uh, you know the reason why we had so many documents um, in this case is that Johan Stefansson, the whistleblower who had a presentation uh, earlier today, that he decided to step forward and, and share this with WikiLeaks and uh, the media that WikiLeaks decided to work with, and uh, and he had he had. Um, he had all all these sources because he worked for Samhiri uh, in Namibia for for four years, and um, so so it was, it's of course because of him that that this story was published. And then we got, then we had access to uh, to further supporting documents uh, about how the DMB Bank is connected to this to the fish rod case, and uh, and we even had documents showing. Like the how 
how the money that Sam had paid to Dubai was in the end uh, transferred to a company owned by one of the sharks, James uh, Hatukalipi. So it, it kind of closed the circle and showed the flow of money from Sam Harie uh, via a company in Cyprus to a company in Dubai and then to this individual, uh, James Hatukalipi, who is now in custody in Namibia. Now, we tried, before publishing the story, we tried to get uh, comments and answers um, from, from Sam Harie, um, Quaker tried repeatedly, and I, I sent. Uh, I, I tried to, to get comments from the CEO as well, and Al Jazeera did as, as well. So, like a month before the publication, we started to try to uh, get some answers from somebody. But unfortunately, we didn't get um, the chance to get answers from the company before we published the story. But the but the the but the story was. Was was very strong and very unusual because we had so many documents. Uh, because Johannes had been like the managing director of Samari in Namibia, so uh, we could publish the story even though Samari took the decision not to talk to us and grant us an interview uh, prior to its publication. Now it's interesting that like I've been writing about Samari for about ten years. And this was the first time that he, the, the CEO of Samiri took the decision not to um, grant me an interview um, uh, to answer questions that um, I thought that he really, really had to, to, to answer. So he, he has, like, throughout the years, always been really accessible uh, and reachable for the media in Iceland, but not in this case. To kind of sum up the fact that he didn't want to, to talk uh, to us, here is a, a screenshot from the TV program, TV program Kvekur, where uh, one of the journalists of Kvekur, Alted Kjartansson, is trying to ask the CEO of um, Samheri about uh, the, the bribes in Namibia. And this is, this is like at the, at the uh, this, is, um, this is a year ago, at the end of October 2019. Like two weeks before the, the publication of the story. And Thorstein just doesn't want to talk to him. Um, they decided to confront him because he hadn't answered, he hadn't answered uh, the emails uh, and the request for interviews that Kvekur had sent him. So he basically he dodged the questions and he started talking about the weather. Now, um, what's interesting in this case is that like, so, because Samri took the decision not to answer any questions about the story before it's uh, prior to its publication. Samri has been, you know, defending itself, uh, the company, over the last year and has been trying to figure out how to answer the, the claims um, that were published in the Fishrod story in November. And they've gone from they've gone from trying to say, they've gone from saying nothing, not answering whether they uh, paid these bribes to the officials in Namibia, and to, to claiming that the, 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 the bribe payments were in fact um, legitimate payments, like facilitation fees or consulting fees. Um, and we, like the, the, the public in Iceland, has been following this, um, uh, the evolution of Sam Harry's, um defense and answers over the last couple of months. And um, Fostet Maur, the CEO of Samari, uh, said finally in uh, August this year um, that the company made some payments to consultants, but they, that they never bribed, bribed anyone. And then the, the, the co-CEO of Samari said in September, um, he said that these payments were legitimate and, and not bribes. So th that, that's the that's the that's the defense that somebody has now, and the claims that they're making now in Icelandic media. Um, of course, somebody knows that the the sources that like support the payments are so many that they are um, undeniable. Um, so th they cannot they cannot deny that the payment took place, but they can't deny the nature uh, of the payments or claim that you know they have their own understanding of the nature of the payments. Now, somebody hired the Norwegian law firm Viborg Grain to do an internal investigation 
profits Namibian operations. Um, when they published or when they came forward with like the gist of the, uh, the findings of Equal Grain uh, this summer, Somebody never claimed that um, that one of it, one of the findings of Report Grain was that the company had not paid consulting fees or bribes, and the reason is because, of course, these these uh, payments are undeniable. Um, one of the one of the the findings that um, that of Report Grain that somebody has been has has, has published is that is that. Um, that Samri didn't own the company Cape Cod um, in the Marshall Islands. Uh, that DNB took a decision to uh, to offboard um, as a client in 2018. But documents show that Samri financed the, the company, and that um, and that the payments that the, the company made were made to the employees of Samri, and and of course DNB thought that Samri controlled the company. Um, during at least some period in time. And then uh, Samiri has also denied um, that Thorstein Maur, the CEO of Samiri, ever gave an order to, to, to pay bribes um, and that Johannes Stefansson was working independently uh, in Namibia. Now, one of the problems with this, this claim, just like uh, as Johannes mentioned uh, in his presentation, is that the, the bribes continued um, the bribes continued after he left the company in 2016 and actually increased. And the last payment to the so-called sharks were made in, in, um, in 2019. Um, and Samiri has been, and to date, Samiri has been, has been uh, defending uh, the company um, uh, basically every week now. And they're, 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 they're kind of, they're honing their, Defense um, and like coming forward with with YouTube videos where they try to refute the claims um, that were published in the story. So it's an ongoing process, like the uh, Samiri's defense. Thank you. Thank you so much, Inge. Um, that was really interesting to to hear. Um, Simon, you are also still with us, I hope, even though your camera and microphone is off. Uh, I have to say, as a, very good. I have to say, as a journalist, it's very inspiring to listen to um, how you actually have worked with these stories. Uh, and I really want to get down to what you actually have done. Um, I believe you said, Ingi, that the story of Samhari started with the whistleblower, uh, Johannes Stefansson. Uh, but uh, Simon, could you tell us how did the story start to begin with? How did you get hold of this information? Uh, it, it started by this invitation by the OCCRP. So we had like a, a small piece of the puzzle, which was these uh, specific transactions going through this uh, uh, can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, I can okay, perfect. You. Yeah, there uh, you perfect. are. Very good. Uh, uh, was this Russian laundromat? And, and we had some specific transactions going through uh, Moldova, uh, and 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 we have never heard in Denmark. We never had a discussion about uh, uh, the, the the Estonian branch of of uh, Bank. It was not an issue. Uh, I think a few people knew that they even were in Estonia. So, so, and, and all of a sudden, this Estonian branch uh, was was highlighted as one of on one of the key banks in this Russian laundromat, uh, laundromat scheme. And this was our starting point. And we said, if this was going on in the Estonian branch of Danske Bank, what was uh, then else going on in the Estonian branch of Danske Bank? So we mm. we made a list of of people. Uh, could have knowledge of this, uh, these transactions, these uh, dealings in the Estonian branch of Danske Bank, uh, and 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 we went on a quest in, in Denmark and and rest of Europe, uh, knocking on doors uh, to, to to search for information. Uh, it's important to remember that when we published the first stories, Danske Bank immediately uh, said that that the, the there had been going transactions through the bank which should never have happened. So we had from the beginning uh, the, the the main character in the, in the in the story was was acknowledging that they had made some 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 mistakes. So we also had like uh, so 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 you would say we had a, a common playing ground, which were that there was going things on in the Estonian branch, which should never have happened. And then we 
went on this search and we landed this story about the Azerbaijan transactions. And then uh, we, we, we followed new, new leads and, and, and also got this whistleblower. So, so it was like, uh, it was a slow start, but, but when it just, uh, when we started digging in, it, it just, uh, uh, it just went on. And I mean, it's it's for me, it's like uh, almost like a paradox when you look at the magnitude of the story, uh, and then hearing you say we had to learn how to do it. Mm -hmm. How does that make sense? <laughs> yeah, but but uh, this was we never. I, I think we had, of course, we, we've been on these conferences uh, for for investigative uh, journalists. We've learned about how to 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 handle big data and, and stuff like that. But but we had actually never been like in a situation where we had a huge leak ourselves uh, of, of so many and, and complex information. So, so in the beginning, we just had like took background meetings in Copenhagen with lawyers and others who could like explain the money laundering regulation. We didn't know, uh, I think none of us had ever written about money laundering before, not, not in this extent. So it was just like, and, and, and so the paradox of this story was the first year, I think in 2017, Nobody was really paying attention in Denmark, uh, and our our and, and the editors of Balinsky were, were saying it's okay, but they were it was not like a high profile story. So it just gradually evolved, and then I think we had several times where we were like, uh, Eva, my colleague, were going to to Brussels to be a correspondent. Uh, Michael was going on leave, so we had different times where we were like, now we need to stop the story. We need to do other stuff, uh, do other stories. But so by coincidence and by maybe instinct and good luck, we just say, okay, maybe we just need to check what's on the next call. And then it just uh, kept on going for, for years like this. Inge, um, you were also up against some powerful uh, forces. What were the biggest obstacles for you during this working process? Uh, the biggest obstacles, uh, of course, it was a period, it, it took many months for us to, uh, to, to, to work on the story. Uh, and so, the, the, I mean, the, the, it was, yeah, it was many, many months. It was a process of, uh, of, uh, of many months. And uh, I guess the biggest obstacle, uh, to be frank, was not talking about this story with anyone when we were working on it because uh, it was such a, a huge story um, and we couldn't actually, we couldn't, I mean, it had to, we had to, to keep silent about, about what we were working on for such a long time. And uh, it was quite difficult um, because of the nature of the story. Um, and of course then, I mean, we had to, we had to, we had to map out all of these companies um, that somebody owned or owns and controls and um, and we had to like put them in a perspective uh, and try to understand how they were like interconnected uh, with the like the, the mother company in Iceland. Mm. And as you saw on the diagram that I showed you um, in my presentation, I mean the 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 net of companies involved in this scheme was was quite complex. So that was definitely something that was an obstacle um, for us. Uh, took quite a long time to, to like to, to, to understand. Mm. What about you, uh, Simon? What did you feel was the biggest obstacle in revealing this story? Uh, I think the biggest of uh, people of, often ask us, uh, did you meet any, uh, the Danske Bank uh, threaten you with lawyers and stuff like that? And, 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 and this is another paradox in the story. It was actually uh, very easy to me. We didn't have uh, we didn't have like uh, people uh, and lawyers threatening us with, if we publish this story and this story. Of course, we had discussions with Danske Bank about uh, what were this and that uh, during these these years. But I think the biggest ob obstacle was to make uh, this story interesting for people because our first stories on this subject were were, were way too technical. Uh, were like and were stories about uh, mystic companies. Uh, uh, transactions going through companies which people have never heard of in countries people didn't know where, where were so the biggest obstacle for us were to 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 get uh, to to tell the story to to get uh, the consequences to get the people to to get to to, to get the attention of people in that way so so this was actually we i think we wrote 
too many articles, which very few people read. So this was a, an obstacle because this was so. It, I think it, it it's not easy. It's the wrong way, but but it's it's more easy to to make stories about uh, companies and and transactions you cannot understand, and you can put up all these questions. But it's it's very hard to 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 get the answers. What are the consequences of this? Who are the people uh, behind this? Uh, mm. And for us, we got uh, uh, this in the the Azerbaijan story because we could ha- have the consequences, and 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 because these transactions were unusual, they were so specific. We could find names of European politicians and 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 so on. So so this was a, a breakthrough, and we also had this whistleblower stories, which of course were explosive. So so so, but this was our biggest biggest obstacle to get people's attention. You're right. We're running out of time, but at the end, I, I want to know what lessons have you learned? How can media best work to ensure transparency in these cases? Inge, go ahead, please. Yeah, um, of course, as I mentioned in my presentation, I mean, the the the, the reason why we published this story is because Johannes Stefansson took the decision to, um, to, to become a whistleblower and to grant uh, WikiLeaks and us access to his documents you know without it without him it would never have been a story because you know we might have heard some rumors about you know something dodgy happening in namibia but we wouldn't have had any documents and we would have just you know we would have had to you know ring uh, to to call the people involved and try to get information from people who probably would not have been willing to talk to us so the key in this story is 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 the whistleblower you know that he had the courage to actually step forward and to to work with us and to share this information with the with the general public. Yes, Simon. Shortly at the end, what do you think? I think the I also think Axel and uh, Linda from SVT talked about this. Uh, the the international cooperation of journalists is, uh, was absolutely crucial for us to 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 understand the the data to help us data, but also to do. Uh, uh, boots on the ground uh, reporting in in various countries. So the international cooperation between journalists are absolutely crucial. That is uh, very good to hear. Uh, thank you so much, to Simon Benson and Inge Williamson, uh, and good luck with your further work. Thank, thank you. you. Very good to thank have you. you. Thank you. Thank you. We will now uh, talk more about the work to protect whistleblowers, and we are very happy to be able to welcome uh, internationally renowned lawyer William Borden. William, welcome to you, Mr. Borden. Hello. Hi. Um, I dare say few people in the world, if anybody, have a bigger knowledge and understanding of what whistleblowers go through than you. You have been representing WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange, Edward Snowden, Antoine Deltour, the man behind the LuxLeaks. And I want to ask you, in your opinion, what are the main challenges that whistleblowers are facing? Um, so first, apologies for my late. Uh, I'm running also after time. Uh, my law firm has been sized by a couple of associations, MOSC, uh, which have been targeted very roughly by the domestic affairs minister these last two days after the uh, absolutely awful assault against a teacher two, two days ago, three days ago in Paris. So we are absolutely over busy. Uh, but I didn't want we to miss. We totally understand. <laughs> no worries. So, uh, so, I, so I've defended Prime Minister Whistleblower uh, for many years. Edward Snowden, Hervé Falciani, HSBC, Swiss Leaks, Andre Delto, Lux Leaks, who has, who has been acquitted after being convicted twice by Luxembourg Supreme Court in compliance with the jurisprudence of the Human Rights Open Court. And it's important here to highlight the fact that the jurisprudence, which will be certainly consolidated in the next years, continue to be a shield for the whistleblowers, especially with, when they cannot be protected by the national law. So we must keep in mind that it's a main tool for them, if it's possible. Uh, and it's certainly one of the uh, legal mechanisms, the most modern protection of whistleblowers. Uh, presently, we are defending new whistleblowers, anonymous, uh, in various parts of the world. Uh, one 
uh, we're supposed to make some leaks at the magnitude of uh, John Doe in Panama Papers. So it's a very, very complex and tricky leaks. Uh, Got to be protected where he is. He's threatened uh, not only by of retaliation, but he's threatened also to be captured and tortured and executed. So uh, we will have to deal more and more with whistleblowers coming from Africa, coming from Asia, Turkey, uh, perhaps Dubai, Hong Kong. Uh, this will be the new generation of whistleblowers we need to protect. And this one uh, cannot uh, envisage to be protected by any kind of NGO, any kind of media, any kind of law. And that's why I've created a, a new NGO, uh, which is, uh, we are a little victim of a success, named PLAF, double P L double A F, Platform of Protection of Whistleblowers in Africa. Uh, and uh, we have been uh, uh, obliged to <laughs> to develop new expertise, new new competence. That is to say, to organize the exfiltration of whistleblowers when they are in risk to be executed or tortured. And uh, this is for me a new uh, a new frontier, much more complex, and to defend classical whistleblowers. Uh, in Europe, as I did, uh, as I've done since many years. Uh, so see if you have time on our website or what we did this, uh, this, uh, since we, we started uh, two years and a half ago in Dakar. We have an office in Johannesburg, in Dakar, in Paris. Uh, I've been in Johannesburg five, six times to structure the defense of the whistleblower, the origin of the Departure of Zuma. Mm -hmm. All women, thanks to women, all <laughs> courageous women, <laughs> white good. and black. <laughs> Listen, I want to ask you because today we've heard from both a whistleblower with protection in the US and a whistleblower without protection in Iceland. Why is it that, for example, democracies in Europe don't have in place sufficient protection for whistleblowers? In Europe? Yeah. In Europe, any other countries as well, but but I mean, Europe, it's, it's... Uh, even if it's not sufficient, even if it is not well respected, but uh, there is a certain level of protection of whistleblower in Europe, and uh, there are many NGOs who try to invite the parliament to pass some law. There are still a lot of resistance. Uh, there is a new directive, the new European directive, which is supposed to be respected by European uh, countries belonging to UA before the end of 2021. Um, and wh what is at stake? What is at stake? There are two, two, two main points which are at stake. Three. One, uh, I defend Rui Pinto. Uh, I've been in Lisbon a couple of weeks ago. This young Portuguese guy at the origin of football leagues and Rwanda leagues. Football leagues, that has been an earthquake. Rwanda leagues, also an earthquake. And uh, I was with him uh, before the court, and he appears with an anti bullet gillette. And he's in a complete ambiguous situation. Uh, he's convicted of one of the charges. Uh, threatened to be sentenced years and years, and he has been admitted uh, as by in the protected witness program simultaneously. So you have two wins simultaneously, two world to make it very caricatural. The old world will want to criminalize him, to convict him, ta -ta -ta. and the other world, uh, modern police forces, modern prosecutor who say, hey, hey, his contribution to truth, to, to main criminal inquiries is very high. So we have to protect him and, and, and we have to consider him as a, as a whistleblower. And, and uh, that's kind of Janus uh, ambiguous situation where a lot of whistleblowers can be. Second, uh, 
there are some members of the French Parliament in European Council uh, who want to hold consequences of the magnitude of the leaks of Rupindo. And what they say? They say we should protect whistleblowers even if they do not break secrets, even if they re reveal many information without any employee link in private or public sector. Mm. And of course, this is a Pandora box because we cannot encourage all the citizens of the world each time they are upset at night and to say, I'm going to post. It could be a source of main damage for private life, reputation, etc. And we see that already it's the case. So we have to imagine that the new law, which will protect uh, whistleblower who act out of the blue, uh, we should require from them uh, an intensity of good faith, of purity in their motivation, extreme. And second, we have to require from them the demonstration that their leaks are, are uh, permit to public opinion to share a very high level of threats against general interest. Not an average threat, a very high level of threat. John Doe, Panama Papers, it's a very high level of threat. Pinto, it's a very high level of threat. And who will determine this? We will put the frontier, an international convention, a European directive, and at the end, the judge. Uh, and uh, third point, uh, what is missing in most of the um, uh, legal system existing in Europe, it's the possibility for a whistleblower who is fired roughly by the administration uh, immediately to obtain of the judge the possibility to be reintegrated in the company. Because there are still many employers who say, okay, you want us to protect whistleblower, we don't give a damn. We will fire them, we will pay damages in five, six years, multiplying bad face recourses, fancy recourses, and at the end, the, main, the, the, the guy will be destroyed. So this is missing in most of the uh, whistleblower system protection. Third point, uh, missing also uh, in France the possibility to obtain civil remedies, uh, reward in compensation uh, of the prejudice of the damages or uh, as also uh, the expression of the gratitude of the state. Mm. It is not in the French culture. Mm. But regarding this missing points, after so many years working on this... Can you, can you speak louder, excuse me? Yes. I said, regarding these missing points, you've said there is a long way to go. But uh, do you see progress after so many years working in this field? Do you see... Do you see progress? Points, excuse me. Do you, you see, see progress? Yeah, I see some progress. Uh, especially, uh, you know, with Silvora, uh, a lot of people were very scary 10 years ago with Silvora. And I take an example, trade unions. It's absolutely not the culture of trade unions to protect whistleblower. And you have more and more prevalent with trade unions in France and in, and in Europe, especially when they have to deal to face the social crisis, the health crisis, COVID crisis, and all the instrumentalization which, are, uh, uh, which occur in many states. And more and more leaders of trade union or classical NGO, human rights NGO, understood that they have launched, they have to launch bridges with whistleblower NGO. And they have to take into account the fact that whistleblower may be considered as uh, the, the ultimate expression of the citizenship and greenness. And, and that they, 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 they must be considered as extremely useful for the general interest, for the public debate, for the democracy. Uh, so we see now new convergence, a new alliance existing between whistleblowers and classical NGO and trade unions. Mm -hmm.
That's very interesting. Last question, if you don't mind. Uh, we've heard from the um, American whistleblower, uh, Bradley Birkenfeld, who got a reward of $104 billion, million dollars, sorry. Um, in your opinion, should whistleblowers have economic incentives uh, to blow the whistle, as in his case? I think we have to distinguish two matters. I, I feel that in the, in the continental European culture, it should be possible to obtain from the, from the lawmakers to accept the principle to indemnify uh, for, uh, for all uh, which has been so harmful for him was when he lost his job. But this is a, a very common and classical way uh, to say, okay, you contribute to truth, you take some risk, state is grateful to you and, and should indemnify you. It's another matter to, to say, hey, hey, uh, please, to stimulate whistleblower in agitating the possibility of an important reward. I have some reserve with that. It's very typical of the US culture to monetize every services rendered to state. It's dangerous because it could, it could accelerate a kind of man hunt. Uh, if, uh, it, it could uh, give some arguments to many opportunists who will try to launch vendetta, revenge, and obtain a uh, award. So I'm skeptical on the possibility in Europe to, to to obtain, uh, considering our historical culture, a uh, possibility to institutionalize reward, but civil remedies and compensation, uh, when you have been extremely targeted and persecuted, yes. I'm afraid we are out of time, but uh, yes. thank you so much for granting us this interview. Really appreciate you taking the time to be with us. And it was very, very interesting to hear your uh, presentation. So thank you Thank so you very much. much. Good luck to everybody and hope to see you soon. Have a nice Same. day. Same. Good luck with your work. Bye. Thank you. Bye. And uh, on that note, we are ready for the fourth session, and this will be on technology. So, Muna, the word is yours. Thank you so much. Um, these sessions are so interesting that we could uh, have had one day at least on each of these topics. Uh, but we are uh, trying to connect what we have learned upon now uh, during this day and to connect it to, to the banks, what is going on there. Uh, and this is often connected to technology. So we, we, we call this session Algorithms and Artificial Intelligence. Uh, can we trust the, the banks to, to reveal illicit financial flows? So the backdrop uh, for this conversation is the, the recent money laundering scandals exemplified uh, here today by both whistleblowers and journalists. Uh, um, and banks are called the first line defense against money laundering. Uh, but pre presentations up until now challenge this, uh, this terminology. When banks receive a critique that they do not red flag suspicious transaction, they often pull to their algorithms. We lean more and more on digitalization, on algorithms and artificial intelligence. Uh, and how can the public know if we can trust them? How can the public know whether or not red flags are produced? And, and whose responsibility is it if a red flag fails? There are many questions and, and what dilemmas should the public know about? We have with us for this session two bank professionals uh, and a professor in artificial intelligence to help us understand more. Uh, this will be a Q&A, so please send your questions uh, to us during this session, and we'll try to pick them up. Thank you. Julia Odden, are you with us online? I'm with you. Thank you. You are an experienced compliance specialist, and have, you have worked with several areas of compliance in different industries. For the past years, you have helped build anti-laundering strategies, 
an anti-financial crime organization in Skandia Bank, and one of Norway's leading uh, challenger banks, you might say. And the critiques against <laughs> banks in these scandals have often been formulated as banks are not sufficient, uh, doing sufficient investigations, or that banks are not does not have robust enough systems. We also heard. Uh, Bradley Birkenfeld uh, called them uh, a, a, a cartel almost. So, so this will leave the public with a lot of question marks. What is going on uh, in the bank sy systems? So is this true, this picture? How, how do you see it from, from <laughs> your side, from the inside as a bank? Yeah, yeah. Um, it's a large question. Um, a broad question. Uh, I think um, a lot of the critique is correct. Um, banks haven't done enough on uh, on the anti money laundering side uh, historically. Uh, that also goes for other institutions um, on different levels. Regulators haven't put enough focus on it. Um, authorities in charge of prioritizing resources to to fighting financial crime. Uh, I think, although you know, for the past years we've seen sweeping AML le legislation that impose uh, hefty sanctions on banks that are in compliance, um, and we're seeing a shift. Um, you know, banks all over—they've been staffing up their AML departments, they're upgrading their technology, running up AML bills of millions and millions of dollars globally. And of course, the degree of compliance varies from bank to bank, region to region. Uh, but I think, generally speaking, we're getting there. And I, I think because everyone is a bit late to the party, I think you know the technology part is also a bit late. Uh, it's not where we want it to be. It's not predicating risk the way we want it to. It's generating huge volumes of false positive alerts that needs to be investigated on the trans uh, transaction monitoring side. Um, which is the holy grail in anti money laundering, I think. So, uh, but I think that we have a lot of people that are working to improve the systems that we have today, the technology part, and we need to keep working uh, to get there. You, you talk about the systems. Can can you explain to us what exactly are the the components in in a bank's anti money laundering work? Can you explain to us? Yeah, I'll try to summarize. Um, a large part of AML work uh, consists of due diligence, basically. So banks, they're performing due diligence measures towards their customers, collecting information, enabling the bank pretty much to know their customers. Who is this person? Who is this customer? Um, what does he want to, how does he want to utilize his customer relationship with the bank? What products, what services does he want to use? And that information that helps us uh, predict the money laundering risk, and it also serves as intelligence information when doing uh, investigations internally. Um, another large part uh, is transaction monitoring. Uh, whereas all the bank's transactions uh, are monitored through uh, a system that generates alerts pretty much uh, that indicates um, suspicious activity, uh, whereupon those alerts are investigated by internal AML investigators um, and that the outcome may be that that activity or that transaction is reported as suspicious to law enforcement. So... You have also been out in the media and explaining, trying to explain that the banks actually are in a squeeze between what we call Finanstilsyne in, in Norway, uh, an authority overseeing the, the banks, and also uh, Økoklim, which is the investigation authority of financial crime. So uh, there is a difference here between quality of reporting and number of reporting. Can yeah. you explain what exactly is this squeeze and, and why is this squeeze yeah. important? Yeah, well, as you said, this has been an issue um, of focus in Norway the past year. I also think it's an issue that many in the financial sector recognizes also elsewhere in the world. Um, when compliance rating by examiners is more driven by things like are there written policies and procedures have there been a uh, hundred percent strict adherence to those procedures rather than the actual efficiency of the systems in place and the quality of the suspicious activity reports that are being filed 
um, we get into a situation where AML is examined much like any other function, which shifts the main focus onto strict compliance. And compliance is important, of course, but we have these laws for one main reason, and that's to get valuable data in the hands of law enforcement. Um, so when regulators are criticizing um, banks for being a couple of days late in a filing or not filing enough reports, that's a problem because it lacks a focus on quality. Um, and it also results in banks um, filing reports um, just out of fear of pushback from regulators, so-called defensive reporting. And defensive reporting always comes at a price. So what you call uh, defensive reporting, that sounds like it might be a box ticking uh, for compliance that you just did what you have to do on, on uh, AML. Is yeah, that, uh, a correct understanding? Yeah, it, like I said, it, 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 uh, le it leads us into a situation where AML is examined like many other functions with more of a ticked box approach rather than a risk-based approach, with, which is the a fundamental guideline within the AML regime. So, yeah. Could you explain to us that, uh, what exactly do you mean by quality of information? What exactly would you need in order to make a better risk assessment? Um, are you uh, talking about reporting to, to, the, to the law enforcement, quality versus quantity? Or to find information yourself? Yeah. Well, um, the quality of a report, it depends, of course, always on the data that you have. So um, the bank needs to have control of its data. It needs to have technology in place to help compile that information so that we can use that information just for something uh, useful and so that we can um, spend our time investigating actual uh, real cases instead of focusing on uh, false alerts pretty much and just reporting them because it might be something but we don't really think so but we're just scared of having pushback from the regulators and it, when the regulators are criticizing the bank for not filing enough reports that typically can result in for example if you have a case with a number of customers involved in one crime, it can result in, in several, several reports um, for each customer um, instead of one collective quality report, just to get the numbers, the reporting numbers up, for example. We heard from some of the cases earlier today that knowing your customer, that was not so much present in many of these cases. It was random people. Can you explain to us what is the problem from the inside of a bank in knowing the customers? What regulation is missing? What data do you need? Uh, I think, you know, the regulation is there, you know, the requirements are there. Um, I think that one of the challenges is, is, is usually technology. Um, so, as I said, we're a bit late to the party and so is the technology part. So we need um, a lot of the banks need better technology. We need to put our focus in improving the technology in compiling data. First of all, we need to get control of the quality of our data so that we know that the data is correct and that we need to have proper um, uh, technology that can help us compile that and give us a proper output with relevant information about the customer and okay. also excluding information that is not relevant. Okay. I would like to say thank you to you now, uh, Julia Odden, uh, since we have a panel here which has both uh, online presence and physical presence. I will now move over to the physical uh, presence of this panel. And with us here uh, on this panel, we have with us uh, Lars Erik Bostad, uh, who is a data scientist, scientist at DNB. And we have with us Ani Yasidi, who's a professor uh, at Oslomet of Artificial Intelligence. I would like to start with a few questions uh, to you, uh, Lars. 
You are a data scientist <coughs> working in the department of anti-money laundering uh, as a data scientist with machine learning to detect suspicious behavior in transactional data. And you work in DNB. And uh, let's be clear, uh, it's not possible for him to say uh, anything concretely about the cases that we have heard here today for uh, logical reasons. Uh, but please do answer as as general and as specific as you can for the public to understand uh, what this means uh, from the inside. So how do you detect um, money laundering using machine learning? Can you explain that in a very simple way? So uh, Julia had made a couple of very interesting uh, and, and, uh, points that, uh, that I can confirm from our side, you know, uh, being late to the party. So, so uh, utilizing Machine learning, for instance, uh, new methodologies like this is, uh, is a fairly recent development in DNB and for, from what I know, most banks. Um, the, the traditional way, and especially when you talk about transaction monitoring, uh, is, uh, and the way it's done in uh, pretty much all banks, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a rule engine, essentially. There are a number of rules and, and you have an, an engine that matches uh, transactions to those rules and fires off alerts. Uh, so one clear challenge with, with this approach is uh, uh, a couple of obvious challenges. First of all, it's not accurate enough. It generates a large number of false positives or, or false alerts that need to be manually investigated, and that's very resource demanding. <clears throat> the other challenge is that um, uh, <clears throat> such a system will will typically only be able to to detect uh, fairly trivial patterns or 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 um, uh, behaviors. So so this is um, uh, so this is where, for instance, machine learning comes in or, and and the use of more advanced methodologies. One to perhaps try to as as uh, <clears throat> as, as one uh, use of this technology to to try to automate some of this very uh, um, resource demanding manual work that's going on. <clears throat> but the other obvious angle is to to try to detect more complex patterns of behavior than than what the rule engine is able to. And um, yes. There was a question uh, in an earlier session uh, today, which you also listened into from uh, from Professor uh, Tina Sörada at uh, Norwegian School of Economics. If how can outsiders know if if bank failure to detect illegal transactions, uh, if this is a result of inadequate capacity or competence or inadequate incentives? What reflections do you have on, on that <coughs> questions? Um. Well, there's probably uh, several factors, uh, including those. Uh, one thing to be aware of is that um, there are, uh, in DNB where I work, which is the largest bank in Norway, and, and a fairly large proportion of daily payment transactions in Norway go through DNB, uh, <clears throat> there's a tiny, tiny portion of those that are actually suspicious, right? How many We're transactions do you have uh, during a, a, a daily uh, bank day? Uh, somewhere between 5 and 10 million transactions. transactions per day. And from work I've done, uh, looking at uh, historical data over a few years, 99.993% um, of those transactions are perfectly legitimate. So it's a and not suspicious in any way. So we're talking a very tiny fraction of, of transactions passing through the bank that, that um, are actually suspicious. And, and that, so that's one challenge. Competence, yes, that can always, of course, be, uh, be uh, addressed and, and improved. Um, incentives, uh, there are a number of incentives. Uh, and, and in my experience, uh, <clears throat> AML work is, uh, is given a very high priority. Uh, and has probably increased over the last few years, pretty much, or 
some of it thanks to the, to the cases that we've heard about today, of course. Are you able to say something about how many people work manually uh, with investigating uh, <coughs> this smaller number of transactions which are flagged as suspicious? Has this number increased over the last years? What are the trends here? Yeah, uh, um, so I personally worked in this area in DNB for, for about two years now, but uh, all during that time it has increased. So I think the, the, if you count all the people involved in AML work in some capacity at DNB, we're talking about several hundred, three to four hundred people. Um, of course, they're not all involved in, in investigating uh, transaction alerts. Uh, that's probably, a, well, 50 plus minus people. Um, and the relation to the, the investments in artificial intelligence as a, an engine, is that increasing as well? It's uh, certainly increasing. It's a fairly new uh, uh, development. Uh, it's only been a couple of years, uh, at least for DNB, where we have started working on this. And, uh, and so it, it, it represents a new way of doing things. It's, it's certainly a <clears throat> small portion of the total investment, uh, if you look at it that way. But um, we're, of course, hoping to, to be able to, to both uh, uh, help make the ongoing work more efficient, put us, uh, uh, or, or enable us to do this work more efficiently, but also to detect other forms of suspicious behavior than the current system is able to. But what, what uh, kind of, yeah, sorry. Sorry. What, what kind of framework and, and, and regulation is, is important for you in, in that work? Uh, <clears throat> so the AML work is, uh, <clears throat> I guess, subject to, to, uh, to legal requirements, compliance requirements, obviously. There's... Uh, there's uh, um, there's the money laundering law in Norway, Vitvasingsloven, which uh, which uh, sets some requirements on on the work we do. Uh, on the other hand, you have, for instance, GDPR uh, that we need to adhere to, and and those those two um, let's say legal requirements are uh, are obviously in conflict uh, in, in in this area. Uh, we need to. We need to monitor transactions. Uh, we need to look into uh, customer behavior according to the money laundering law. Um, On that note, I think it would be, be very interesting to move uh, over to Anas Yassidi. You are leading the Applied Artificial Intelligence Research Group here at OsloMet. Uh, you published over 130 research uh, articles and you're among the top 50 most published uh, researchers uh, in Norway, according to the most recent survey by Forskud Forum. You know a lot about this. You uh, have several awards uh, from international conferences and, and you're also a uh, senior member and editor of various international journals on this topic. Um, from your experience, how can we learn uh, or how could machine learning or an artificial intelligence be used to detect suspicious transactions? Could you try to explain to us how this works in a non-technical way as possible for, for our audience who would like to understand more? So uh, there are two types of uh, machine learning um, algorithms. One is uh, one that is called uh, supervised learning and one that is called unsupervised learning. For the unsupervised learning, it means that um, you have all, uh, let's begin with the supervised learning, which is easier. For the supervised learning, it means that you have data with um, that is um, uh, labeled with the ground truth. What does it mean? It means that you have data where you say these transactions are money laundering, these transactions are fine. These are totally um, uh, uh, legitimate uh, transactions. And then the role of the artificial intelligence is to 
uh, to automate this uh, cognitive process that we human beings are doing to imitate the human being um, capabilities of reasoning. And the advantage of artificial intelligence in this case is processing a lot of information that we that is overwhelming for human beings. We cannot trans uh, we cannot uh, sit manually and go through millions of a transaction, but the machine will, uh, in a way, uh, replace this uh, this work, the human. But there is another type of artificial intelligence, which is uh, called uh, um, unsupervised learning, where we have the data, but we don't know what is legitimate or what is not legitimate. But we can find some anomalous trends. For example, I don't know this. For this type of company, those transactions are too big for the size of the company. It's a little bit like, for example, if you go into um, a country where most of the people are in average are tall and then you you find someone that is uh, sh uh, short in that population then that person will be tagged as anomalous uh, in a sense this transaction yeah is deviating from from the data so uh, trends that uh, that deviate doctor i don't know for example if i take uh, doctors maybe there are some type of uh, transactions that are not common for this type of doctor for example to uh, too often or too large or something uh, like this. So these are the two types. For this type where we throw the data without knowing anything about what is legitimate and what is legit illegitimate, uh, there is no there is no risk, let's say, of um, of bias. So it's just because the algorithm will not will not make a mistake. It's just we, we human beings that look at okay, the algorithm says that this transaction looks uh, is out of the trend then we human beings can come and observe it for the first part which is learned by example is there where the algorithm might make uh, mistakes if we uh, uh, if in a way we delegate the decisions uh, to, to those algorithms could you elaborate a little bit more on that what are the what is a bias in an algorithm okay. just explain that and if you yes. also can give a an example of how that can happen in in a society what what may happen what might be the consequences okay uh, an example of by uh, uh, let, uh, for example let's suppose we have a, a system based on artificial intelligence to decide whether i get a loan or not or whether i get insurance or not or whether for example i get into university or not and the system will par will have very good predictive power if I, if I put the ethnicity or uh, my um, my social uh, social status into consideration because we know probably that uh, that poor people uh, they might um, have problems to pay the uh, not poor people but people come from poor regions for example if I live for example uh, in um, in a part in uh, Oslo that is uh, flagged as uh, uh, as a ghetto or something like this, then there is um, maybe a higher chance that I will not pay my loan. But this is unfair because if I if I start uh, giving loans on this basis without looking uh, at the person himself or accepting people to university based only on their it needs some I'm defavoring some people. So we we are going in against the principle of people having uh, uh, equal uh, equal chances. And the, still the system might uh, work well because the predictive power will be very high for the system. It's, for example, if we are monitoring uh, people and we monitor people based on ethnicity, the system will, be, will work very fine. Uh, the predictive power of the system will be high. We'll be catching more criminals, let's say. But the problem is that the system is unfair because it's making more error for some categories of people. Because what we are uh, doing we are uh, oversampling from some subcategories, for example, let's say companies from uh, Middle East or people from Middle East, we are oversampling them and we are finding the reporting more crimes. We are catching more crimes, but what we are uh, doing, we are biasing the system because there is higher error for those uh, people. Uh, so the system will not uh, give the same error rate uh, for, let's say, people from uh, Middle Eastern background or from people from uh, European background. So, um, yeah, so what is fairness of the system? The system should not make, uh, sh should not quanti uh, should, uh, should have almost the same performance uh, across different uh, categories. So it should not generate, it, it should not um, 
uh, it should not in a way focus on the category because we in, we have a, for a, a knowledge beforehand that this category statistically is uh, commits more more crimes or over to you, Lars. How do you avoid creating biases on, on, on regular people wanting loans or making regular transa transactions and trying to, <coughs> to target uh, artificial intelligence to pick up on a business model which is marked by a high level of secrecy or, or opacity uh, more than other, uh, other markers? Mm. Well, um, the, this is a this is a, a fundamental challenge in 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 working with <clears throat> with data and and algorithms and, and machine learning, uh, and um, I think uh, uh, with the with the requirements we have in place now, with the system we have in place now. The, the 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 models we use within AML differ from, for instance, loan applications, which, which can, may be automated. Right, yeah. you have that today in many banks. You you, you apply and you, and you essentially get an immediate uh, yes or no uh, based on some <clears throat> algorithm. This is not the case within AML. We may or we use machine learning models to, for instance, uh, for risk classification of customers, uh, but this does not. Um, <clears throat> this is the, the the prediction or classification from this model will always be subject to a manual process afterwards, right? <clears throat> so there's no uh, automatic um, consequence or or impact on the customer, whether it's uh, you know we we're not nowhere near you know automatically reporting a customer to Ecocrim based on a machine learning algorithm. <laughs> Um, so there is this manual investigation or processing that takes place afterwards. So <clears throat> this is not to say that bias is not an issue, but at least we're 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 not uh, looking at these kinds of challenges uh, that you may have when automatically, you know, admitting to university or automatically granting a loan. Mm -hmm. We we often hear that artificial intelligence can solve almost anything. Uh, at least there are, there are two different uh, debates uh, in, in, uh, in the research environment that artificial intelligence can solve anything. Uh, and there's also another uh, debate perhaps that, that there are some limits. Um, can artificial intelligence challenge and reveal this business model of secrecy? Uh, yeah, um, I, I think there are a lot of uh, yeah, uh, yeah, a lot of uh, ambitions, and uh, artificial intelligence is becoming a little bit of a hype because many people think that it will solve uh, many things, uh, but it's not. Uh, it's not true. It will not. Um, at, at least what I can claim, it might might be uh, mistaken. Uh, it I might be proven wrong in maybe five or ten years from now. Artificial intelligence will not uh, surpass our human um, capacity or our. Uh, so it will just uh, automatize, uh, automatize some tasks that we human beings are doing. This is so. This is artificial intelligence is redoing the same cognitive process that we are doing, but with much uh, faster and much more uh, computational uh, resources. So uh, it might. So artificial intelligence will not find things that we human beings are not able to find if we are given enough time. So this is uh, at least this is my, uh, my, this is my claim. Um, so there are people that might think that uh, AI might uh, might uh, might find uh, find, uh, for example, um, money uh, laundering uh, in a magical manner. But this is, is not true. It will it will just find something that we human beings are able to find. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Another question about artificial intelligence. The core issue with, with artificial intelligence is that machine learning, it, it's going to learn by itself eventually. Yes. And algorithms are getting so complicated. Yes. So what if an algorithm fails? 
an algorithm should have detected something yeah. and it learned or it mislearned uh, and it fails. <sighs> Whose fault is it if an algorithm fails? Is oh. it those who bought an algorithm in the beginning? Um, is it the algorithm? Can that can an yeah. algorithm be held legally responsible, or where do we place a responsibility if an algorithm fails? Yeah. So uh, the problem with uh, many of those artificial intelligence algorithms that they are so called the black box, it's very 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 difficult to understand how these algorithms come to um, come to to conclusion. Uh, we get the conclusions, but we don't. We can't explainability, and uh, is very diff uh, is a very big problem with those algorithms. We can't. They are so far not very much able to explain how those decisions are uh, concluded, and it might be that those algorithms are overfitting the data. So, so the, then, what the role of the people that are developing those algorithms is to test this these algorithms uh, in a thorough enough manner, because there are some tools to understand uh, to test this algorithm to say, for example, to to see whether they are biased uh, or not, because. If I give a simple example, uh, sometimes the algorithm might base a decision on things that are not related to the truth. For example, uh, there were, uh, if I take um, one of the, um, the system for um, uh, f most uh, f a famous example in AI, for example, for detecting whether, um, at least in the 70s, whether um, to differentiate between uh, U.S. tanks and uh, well, and during the Cold War and uh, and Soviet Union tanks, what the algorithm based its decision, uh, despite the algorithm was very accurate, but it learned to base its decision based on the background and the picture because it is much darker and so in the Soviet Union because it's colder than in the US. So you can, so the algorithm might find ways, other ways to, to give good predictions that are not based on the facts, but based on other things, for example, it might be that it is basing its decision based maybe only on race and uh, where the people are coming from and stuff like this, instead of looking at the real uh, transactions the, uh, themselves. So the role then of uh, uh, the designers, uh, there are many roles, many things to improve this, uh, the whole process and to give more um, uh, credibility to other algorithm and more fairness and so one of the things to go uh, around this is to test thoroughly those algorithms to avoid so-called algorithmic bias but also to ensure that um, the data set is uh, that we are using is representative uh, enough for our categories uh, because uh, uh, because if I feed um, a data set with uh, with uh, with uh, for example an over dominant category for, let's suppose uh, i'm giving a, um, trying to predict whether i give a loan to uh, to people uh, but uh, the system is more over dominated by let's say uh, men uh, long, yeah, records regarding men and little uh, records regarding women so we have an uh, unbalance in the data which might be in, not in the favor of women so th th there were systems like this such as uh, um, Amazon that were discriminative against women based on their uh, CVs because the system was dominated by CVs of, of men then when they look at the CV for a woman that wants to get a job into technology, her CV will be very, very badly ranked because she's a woman, because the system is biased towards men. So one thing is uh, ensuring that the data is representative enough for the different uh, categories of the society. And the, yeah. yeah, the <coughs> last thing is um, when I spoke about uh, data that is uh, where we feed the data with uh, example, it might be that we human beings uh, can pollute the data itself by giving, because in the end it's uh, it's we who do the judgment, it's, and we human beings, we have prejudice. So if I make a system to give loans or to decide on loans or to, to tag maybe, t uh, to, to, to f for example, to say these transactions are suspicious, just to, it might be that we human beings, we are, introducing the bias in the data because we have some prejudices and we give the wrong examples to uh, to the AI system and the AI system will just reflect this uh, bias, this human bias, so it will imitate us. So Lars, uh, going back to you again, uh, as, as uh, 
a person who's working in a bank who has been in the media uh, in large uh, scandal recently. And, and, and going back to the, what I asked Julia in, in the beginning, that the banks has been uh, critiqued, that banks are not doing sufficient investigation. <clears throat> Bank does not have robust enough systems. Is it true? <sighs> Uh, I don't think there's a yes or no answer to that. There, there's a truth in it. Uh, there's a lot of effort uh, put in to, to improve existing systems, to, to uh, introduce more advanced uh, methodologies, uh, for instance, as I'm working on. So, um, uh, yeah, I don't think it's, it wouldn't be fair to say yeah, that's how it is. Um, there's a lot of um, <clears throat> uh, uh, there's a lot of work going on to become better at at detecting uh, suspicious behavior, financial crime, all sorts that's going on. And uh, and I think the banks have an, a clear responsibility to to uh, to do that work as best we can. So in the and, future, and the intention is certainly to do, to <laughs> to be as good as possible uh, to do that. So in the future, will we will banks be better at stopping uh, these kinds of transactions? I certainly think so. Yeah, in the future. <laughs> um, but but yeah, uh, we 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 at the NB at other banks are working hard at becoming better. And, and knowing, understanding the limitations of the current system, uh, <clears throat> seeing how we can how we can model data in different ways, how we can uh, introduce uh, machine learning and other uh, ways of using algorithms to to detect uh, patterns in in different ways. Uh, so this can only get better. Yes, and I'm I'm. Uh, certain we will get there. We already have good examples of that internally. Okay. Um, I will <clears> then, uh, due to time constraints, I will then uh, leave uh, this uh, panel debate with you. Thank you both for being with us uh, here today. And thank you to Julia Odden, who was with us in uh, online. And we have now come to the fifth session in this program called How to Reveal Financial Crime. Tax savings and, and uh, aggressive tax planning and uh, all of the different uh, legal constructions are very, very complex uh, phenomena used by multinational companies, both uh, wanting to, to minimize or evade taxes, but also to hide information. Uh, this is a complexity and also fragmentation as a business model in order to make it as difficult as possible to investigate. In light of this kind of a business model, how can, uh, how can we reveal financial crime? And, and with us to uh, talk to that topic, we have... Um, Two people, one uh, person who is the new director of Ökokrim, which is the Norwegian National Authority for Investigation and Prosecution of Economic and Environmental Crime. And we also have with us an academic from the UK, Nicholas Lord, uh, who is a professor of criminology uh, at University of Manchester. Uh, both uh, of these presentations are recorded. The first one is in an interview and the second one is a pre-recorded presentation. So we would like to start with um, an interview with Paul Lundset, the new director of Ökokrim. He has extensive experience in investigations on organized and financial crime. Uh, he has been the deputy minister in the Ministry of Justice, senior public prosecutor, judge and lead, legal advisor in the UN project in Afghanistan, and also a partner in PWC. So we'll now hear more of uh, what his ambitions are in um, challenging such business models as we have been discussing here today. So please, let's play the pre-recorded uh, interview. Welcome to Mr. Paul Lundset. 
Mr. Paul Lundset is the new head of the Norwegian National Authority for Investigation and Prosecution of Economic and Environmental Crime. Welcome to the conference. Thank you. How do you think that Ökokrim should align its work uh, in the face of the new mo business model involving tax havens, uh, legal fragmentation and complexity of company structures, legal privilege, uh, legal hybrids? How should you align your work? Well, let me start by uh, saying that uh, we are organized as a diverse uh, setup with uh, different competences, uh, different backgrounds, uh, different educations. Uh, so we're both in, we're both in a prosecution organization, but we're also a police investigation uh, organization, law enforcement organization. So, uh, um, the reason why I'm mentioning the, uh, <coughs> the um, diversity of, uh, of uh, uh, the background for those who work for Ecogrim is that I think that's very crucial going forward as well in combating new threats. Uh, and uh, the way we are doing this is that we have uh, an own department uh, collecting uh, intelligence-based uh, information uh, and assessing threats uh, from from the environment that you also mentioning, uh, and then we'll take it down and, and start investigations uh, towards uh, companies, structures, and individuals, and uh, uh, and their uh, and their uh, helpers uh, in in crime that is very organized. So it's basically uh, doing having the right structure having the right competences and of course it's about resources as well but we all always work uh, the best we can with the resources that we have hmm. could you mention some specific threats that you see today well uh, to be uh, to be very up to date in the pandemic situation i mean we have different uh, uh, different uh, supportive, uh, financial supportive uh, uh, arrangements from the government in Norway uh, that are supposed to help uh, the economic situation during the pandemic situation. Um, that, is, uh, um, that is structure that is, uh, is possible to, to commit fraud against. So that is one of the things that we are working most with now. Uh, so uh, we, we're looking at the threats and then we, which threats are the most fundamental and then we allocate resources on, on, on that. Mm. Mm. Both in terms of preventing crime but also in terms of uh, actually uh, do law enforcement investigations against and prosecutions against uh, committed crime. And the business model where secrecy is a key ingredient how do you how do you look upon that kind of a threat? Well, it, it for us it's of course it's difficult when we have to investigate uh, financial crime, uh, an economic uh, crime, and, and environmental crime um, abroad, where where the structures are uh, are kind of hidden behind uh, secrets and uh, law firms and. Uh, uh, bank secretaries and everything. Of course, that's a different. Def that's a difficult uh, issue for us. But we use the international uh, framework that we we have, the international cooperation that we have, uh, and we'll uh, we'll always keep fighting against those structures and trying to get information behind. But it's a uh, it, it's a huge job and it's uh, complicated. Panama Papers and Paradise Papers, Swiss Leaks and LuxLeaks, they all showed um, the public what kind of actors uh, most often are involved, that being criminal networks, uh, big companies, uh, rich individuals, but also politically uh, important people. How do you make sure that Ökokrim is uh, independent and not influenced by 
by powerful actors. Well, if you look at the Norwegian structure on the Ökokrim and the police and the prosecution service uh, as, as a whole, uh, I think that you will see that uh, um, we are very independent as, uh, as prosecutors. Uh, I've been prosecutor for, uh, I don't know, uh, 20 years or so. Uh, and I actually never experienced that any politician at least will will try to influence the work that we do that's that's the Norwegian situation where we have strict regulations against it and it's uh, it's, it's well respected regulations uh, the situation for our colleagues somewhere else in the world is of course very different uh, and we have we have to acknowledge that and we all we we have to we try to support them in and support the systems that are working to have police and prosecutors uh, as dependent as possible from from uh, from politicians and uh, political institutions. Hmm. Hmm. We know that facilitators such as lawyers, <coughs> um, accountants, banks, they play an important role in facilitating. Uh, we have learned uh, through LuxLeaks also that tax planning arrangements are uh, marketed uh, even though they have a 50% probability of being unlawful uh, if found <coughs> out. What kind of reflections do you do in, um, in facing such, such facts? Uh, it, of course, that's very problematic. But uh, I, again, uh, I think that we, I think we need to fight those uh, facilitators that uh, uh, that is important for uh, for financial crime, uh, making sure that they are accountable for uh, for also having uh, participated in or in organized and financial crime. Mm. So. Uh, I don't think it's very difficult prosecuting the actual uh, criminals doing the financial crime versus uh, prosecuting the facilitators as long as you, uh, you, only, you only have to find the evidence for that the facilitators are actually perpetrators as well, uh, committing the crimes together with the, uh, with, with the actual first-hand uh, uh, people that uh, commit the crime. It's, it's all about... Um, uh, prosecuting the uh, entire structure that you see uh, are are important for for uh, the crime being committed. Hmm. So it's uh, it's 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 all about finding, of course, evidence uh, also against the facilitators, and I think that's an important step. Hmm. Which resources do you think Ökokrim will need in the future in order to? challenge facilitators or challenge this business model? Well, we do need, uh, of course, uh, very professional law enforcement uh, uh, individuals trained as lawyers, police uh, investigators, special investigators, uh, uh, investigators that uh, know how to secure digital evidence uh, so it's about setting uh, setting up an organization and building an organization, developing an organization and maintaining this organization to be uh, solid so you have all these competences uh, involved in one investigation team. And then uh, using those competences uh, specifically uh, targeting um, the, the perpetrators. Mm. Mm. Being uh, a new head of Ökokrim, <coughs> what, what kind of footprint uh, would you like to leave with Ökokrim now, uh, going into? Uh, well, <laughs> well, I've said that uh, it, it, it's. Uh, I have kind of a, a, a good start in the sense that uh, it's it's it's, a, it's it's the people we work for Ökokrim is so very uh, dedicated uh, in what they do. Uh, they are competent. Uh, so, but I've said that uh, I want an Urko cream that it's uh, um, more extrovert in sense of uh, having a conversation with uh, with with um, uh, 
banks and the rest of the financial system so that we also can utilize the resources that actually uh, the banks have as a first yeah, first line of, prosec uh, of uh, protection against financial crime because I mean uh, the banks uh, have to report uh, suspicious uh, transaction to us so if we have that system working well we will have uh, enormous uh, uh, amount of information coming into us that we could use in the intelligence space to target the right individual who um, who is the the greatest threats in terms of uh, financial crime. Mm. Okay. Thank you, Paul. Um, good luck with an important job. Thank you. The new director of Ökokrim. We will now go directly over to Nicholas Lord. Um, presenting on uh, the elusiveness of illicit finance in a globalized economy, some criminological uh, reflections. Nicholas Lord is, I said, professor of uh, criminology. He joined the University of Manchester in 2013 and teaches in areas such as white collar and corporate crimes, financial and economic crimes, serious and organized crimes, and criminological research. Um, without uh, further, I would like to just let us play his presentation. Hi, I'm Nick Lord, Professor of Criminology at the University of Manchester in the UK. I'm very pleased to have been invited to participate in this conference that addresses the very significant issue of global illicit finance. As a criminologist, one of my main research interests is in the empirical analysis of the nature, organization and control of criminal activities, mainly serious financial crimes, including corruption and money laundering. So in today's presentation, I'll reflect from a criminological perspective on the elusiveness of illicit finance in a globalized economy. And more specifically, I'll discuss how purported processes of globalization shape and influence the organizational aspects of illicit finance. That is, the ways in which criminal or unethical actors go about organizing how they will control, conceal and convert the finances required for and generated from their criminal or illicit behaviors. So what can criminology offer in this discussion? Well, in my view, a very useful mode of analysis for approaching the organization of illicit finances is to generate, organize, and systematize knowledge about the procedural aspects and the procedural requirements of illicit financial flows and to understand which factors shape how they are organized and who gets involved over time and place. So in criminological terms we call these the crime scripts and here I'll think about globalization and the scripts of illicit finance. So in the presentation I'll very briefly touch upon my approach to illicit financial flows Though there is much to be said on this theme, and I expect many of this, uh, many of you in the audience will know much of this material already, but I'll then outline a few features of globalized economies and the connections to illicit financial flows before presenting some key criminological reflections on the relationship between illicit financial flows, globalization, and the organization of illicit finances. In a forthcoming publication with Professor Liz Campbell, we analyze the response to illicit financial flows in relation to the UN's Sustainable Development Goal 16.4. I won't go into detail now about how we conceptualize illicit financial flows in this paper, uh, and, and much of this will not be new to you in any case. But we do take a broad and inclusive approach, incorporating both normative and legal violations that in turn includes financial uh, finances generated from unambiguously criminal behaviours, but also 
unethical practices such as corporate tax avoidance. So if the organization of illicit finances was originally a largely local issue and then a state or a national issue, then it is now increasingly a global phenomenon with its most significant forms transcending national boundaries. Globalization has in some cases altered the scripts, that is the procedural aspects of money laundering in that illicit financial flows can be organized across jurisdictional borders. Corresponding risks can be externalized to other places and criminal asset creation can be exported to conducive environments. Often such activities are made possible by a cyber and digital systems and structures associated with globalization, usually alongside developing patterns of business behaviors in a more interconnected and interdependent world. Globalization then, despite being a very contested concept, has emerged as a significant analytical factor. For instance, greater interconnectedness in the form of the mobility of ideas, information, capital, people, goods and services globally has created increased opportunities for moving illicit finances across borders generating new opportunities for would-be offenders, both individuals and organizations. Such actors and their usually professionally, uh, professional intermediaries and facilitators can more readily exploit the structural, legal, political, economic and cultural asymmetries that exist across jurisdictions. So the significance of spatial differences and similarities between sovereign states is fundamental to the organization of illicit finances internationally. Relatedly, these increased mobilities refer not only to the or tangible physical things, but also to digital markets, products and services. Technological innovations generate new means of organizing illicit finances in other jurisdictions without actually being there, allowing variation in terms of the remoteness or spatial connections between offenders, victims, and offending contexts. This also facilitates how offenders can neutralize criminal activities, harms, and uh, victims while removing evidential connections between what they know or do. And this has implications for investigation, prosecution, and conviction. Finally, key Interdependencies between people, markets, and industries have accompanied globalization, and this results in activities in one jurisdiction having major impacts in other jurisdictions, reflecting the increased complexity of modern financial arrangements. Thus, I've been keen to emphasize the significance of beyond nation state dynamics in analyses of illicit finances as there is almost always a cross-border dimension. So to some final criminological reflections. First, the, the flow of illicit finances globally most often are parasitical on patterns of routinized business practices. That is, there is a ready-made and enduring financial structure and system in place behind which illicit finances can easily be concealed. For instance, just think of the misuse of corporate vehicles, organizational structures, and other legal entities in most white collar and corporate crimes. Second, globalized economies do not necessarily lead to illicit finances being organized beyond individual nation states, especially if laundering can be done successfully domestically. But in terms of the organization of the laundering, globalization increases opportunities for identifying and recruit, recruiting co-offenders, whether they be complicit or not. And finally, processes of globalization have created a dynamic market of professional intermediaries such as trust and company 
service providers that are frequently being used to manage illicit finances by presenting an illusion of legitimacy for and concealing the identities of those behind the assets adapting to changing circumstances, which in turn alters the scripts of the crimes and minimizes the risks of detection for those involved. So this raises some key analytical and empirical questions that we need to consider when analyzing the organization of illicit finances. For instance, why might any given case in, uh, involving illicit finances make use of other jurisdictions? Are the criminal or unethical activities coordinated from one jurisdiction or collaborative across many? Why do some jurisdictions offer value to those organizing illicit financial flows? Which jurisdictions offer the optimal balance between social and physical comfort and the risk of having assets seized? Which skill sets or contacts are needed to realize these opportunities? In other words, we need to better understand variations in the organization of illicit finances within and across different jurisdictions and the factors that drive this, including why it might be necessary to organize illicit finances across borders. Alongside this, it is beneficial to investigate the distribution and concentration of the different ways of organizing illicit finances across jurisdictions to better understand why some crimes are organized as they are and whether key similarities or differences exist in the organizational dynamics over time. So thinking through these procedural aspects and the impacts of wider social drivers is key to helping understand the organization of illicit financial flows over time and place. Thank you. Then we say thank you to Nicholas Lord for his uh, presentation. I think it is very interesting to see all this as a whole. Uh, and another professor who will be with us is Tina Sørede. She's a professor of law and economics. Her research is focused on corruption, governance, market and development, currently more with an emphasis on law enforcement at NHH. Uh, she will talk about whitewashing, money laundering. And without further ado, I would just like to ask Tina if you are with us from Bergen. I am with you and I'm trying to share my screen. Can you see it? Yes. Okay, so you have my, you have yes. my, you can see my full slides. Yeah. And please note uh, everybody in Zoom, you are uh, able to write questions uh, to Tina while she is presenting. So over to you, Tina. Uh, thank you very much, Mona. And uh, I have two screens here. So, so please confirm that you can actually see my slides. You can. You can hear me and you can see my my slides. I cannot hear a response. I can hear you and I can see your slides. I just okay, thank myself. you. Then I can begin. Thank you very much. And thank you for this title that you gave me on whitewashing. Uh, I think that's um, a very good uh, opportunity to speak about this uh, this thing that the uh, Cambridge Dictionary defines as an attempt to stop people finding out the true facts about a situation. And uh, I will not be talking about such blunt situations as those uh, mentioned in this article from Moscow Times, uh, uh, where um, somebody had painted snow to make it look less polluted. We will be talking about uh, government's uh, efforts to to um, reduce economic crime. And this is a topic I've uh, studied quite a bit, uh, including with uh, Professor Kalimone, who was uh, uh, prevented from participating here today. And we wrote a book chapter called Good Governance Facade, 
um, where we explain why some policy initiatives are not only serve are, are not only failing. It's the problem is not only that they are not implemented efficiently. A part of the problem is also that they can conceal government's uh, uh, poor performance and even corruption. And uh, in this, um, and that may sound uh, obvious to some of you, but uh, we show in this with a theory how um, how the there is a trade-off for governments because if they perform poorly, of course, the cake, um, the economy is performing worse, and uh, and there will be a less to grab from. So we are studying this from a corruption perspective. Uh, there will be less, uh, this, a smaller cake to steal from, but of course, by concealing true uh, activities, true performance, uh, the slice for the decision makers it can be bigger. So there is a trade-off in this, and that's what we study. And um, and this problem, of course, goes across uh, different circumstances. We can see such um, facade uh, efforts uh, in infrastructure projects in some development aid programs, anti-corruption agendas, uh, we see that some of the soft, some of the initiatives that begin as soft law initiatives before they be turn into hard law, such as the EITI, OGP, or FATF initiative-based uh, rules, sometimes they are more of a kind of a facade than a true uh, policy that is being enforced. In this paper, we refer to some case countries such as Angola, Colombia, and Indonesia as, as vulnerable, but that's simply because we know them. And, um, and there are examples in many places. I show this photo from the Itaiko Dam in Brazil and Paraguay, where at the border, uh, where you can find examples of all sorts of fraud and corruption hidden behind an infrastructure project. So this is a situation where those involved uh, use the whole initiative to, to grab. It was supposed to be a good electricity initiative and it was used for, for grabbing in grand scale. So this, this, this problem that I'm talking about is um, across sectors and not referring only to the financial sector alone. Now, such whitewashing and uh, poor, per, poor true performance, is that a problem in the OECD countries too? Well, if we look at the areas that we are focusing on today, if we're looking at the FATF-based AML regulations and the 20 years old OECD foreign bribery convention, um, the picture is quite uh, gloomy. Actually, these are initiatives. And when we study this in research, it appears as if some governments have signed these, these principles and rules. They brag about them and they implement them and forget about them. So, so this is actually the status. And looking at this very new report from, from Transparency International, which uh, keeps track of how governments enforce the foreign bribery regulations, they actually show that out of the 44 countries that signed that convention, only four countries actually actively enforce it. And, and they are performing worse than before on, in this area. So, so governments in the OECD countries are actually performing worse than before when it comes to enforcement of foreign bribery regulations. In one of my recent uh, current research papers, we studied this in a bit more detail. Also, this is a combination of an economic uh, model, a theory, and, um, and some case data. And we study um, the government's incentives to enforce different sorts of crime, depending on the political emphasis on producer surplus, that means the private sector, versus its emphasis on benefits for society at large. So that is a kind of a trade-off for governments. And what we see is that uh, when the consequences, uh, well, this is apart from the theory, when the consequences of crime materialize abroad, uh, the incentives uh, for governments um, to, uh, to, to enforce this legislation, this, this form of legislation decreases substantially because they experience the benefits from the crime in their own society and uh, 
and problems occur elsewhere. There is a lot more to this theory, but that's, um, I leave that for now. But if you look at this table with the cases, you see only the, the reference to cases. In this study, we had 50 cases from five countries, and actually it's quite difficult to get information about them. Um, and we categorize the uh, cases upon an analysis of the markets in which the companies operated. So we saw, looked at whether they were operating in concentrated market, not concentrated, whether the penalty held a level that could deter such crime in the future, or whether the penalty appeared to be too low to have any preventive effect on other companies in the market. And um, these letters behind the first letter refers to the crime, which is a violation of competition law, bribery, and L is money laundering. And the, and the second letter, A and H, refers to whether the crime materialized, the consequences materialized abroad or at home. And out of these cases, uh, which is a limited selection, there is a trend to pe penalize corporations more softly if the consequences of the crime uh, materialize abroad. So this is, uh, this is also in uh, 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 considering what Nicolas uh, Lord just said about the need for international enforcement. This study definitely confirms such need. Um, and why can there be such differences well, I want to tell you about the, another study of studied uh, enforcement of corporate liability for several years. And we did a survey of how this happens in 66 countries. And we did this book on negotiated settlements in bribery cases with many chapters, including by Nicholas Lord, on, on how, um, how uh, enforcement happens in these cases. And, and there has been a trend over the last 15 years to conclude these cases with a settlement and not bring the cases to court. And that leaves the governments with more flexibility. There's less information shared with the public. The enforcement situation is cooperation based. Companies can kind of, there can be information back and forth between the prosecutor and the company. And in, in the end, we see we, there's every reason to believe that the deterrence is somewhat weaker, even if there is more enforcement cases as a result of such settlement-based enforcement. This case on Rolls-Royce um, uh, was enforced in the UK and the US, which have the most developed regulations in this area, and, and still uh, Rolls-Royce uh, appeared to be treated um, somewhat soft by the UK Enforcement Agency, and no individual in the UK was uh, charged for, for the offence. Now, um, if we look at uh, another study that I am also conducting together with uh, Leonardo Bolini, a professor at Bocconi University in Milan, uh, we have evaluated, as we have done a systematic review of all the FATF evaluation reports of countries. And uh, uh, what we find uh, is that um, countries' enforcement of the AML regulations are, I, fo I found them surprised, I find, found it surprisingly weak because I have followed the discussions that have taken place over the last 10 years, so I was, I was actually wondering if the evaluation criteria had changed and become stricter, but the, that is not the case. Um, so countries have hardly improved when it comes to enforcement over the last 10 years. And we have data going back and we have also, are also comparing uh, with a specific study 10 years ago. So, so this is why we know. And if you look at this graph, you see some dips um, this is, uh, so this is the performance levels ranking from actually from one to four, four is good. Uh, and you can see on the table on the left, the list of evaluation criteria when it comes to FATF based uh, 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 regulation. And so, country, so FATF organizes evaluations of countries according to these criteria. 
And, and what we find is that uh, especially there are some areas where countries perform really bad, badly. Um, and um, uh, the first dip in the, at the start of the table, the, the, the illustration shows that uh, when it comes to the ability to assess risk and coordination between the institutions involved in oversight and enforcement, countries are generally performing bad. And that is also the case when it comes to confiscation of stolen assets. They are not uh, generally performing, not able to, to recover the stolen funds. Um, and this uh, third uh, uh, dip, the deepest, um, that uh, refers to beneficial ownership. So there's hardly any transparency uh, of uh, beneficial ownership in any of the countries that that have committed to the FATF-based uh, regulations. Uh, so, um, and also we find similar patterns across all kinds of countries, while normally when we look at other areas of regulation, we see variation with the uh, other socioeconomic factors. We see that some countries, for example, here we would expect countries with a large shadow economy to have a different pattern and so on, but we don't, uh, the countries, rich and poor seem to be challenging in the same areas. And one of the areas, on several areas, they're actually performing worse than 10 years ago. And when it comes to mutual legal assistance, that means countries' uh, inclination to assist one another in international investigations. When it comes to such, um, such operations, uh, they, it, it is performing, they are performing worse. This, it's harder to, to get assistance from other countries today when it comes to investigation of economic crime compared to 10 years ago. Uh, so it is uh, tempting to mention this citation from UN uh, leader Vini Banayima, who says the rule of law, access to justice and financial transparency happened by design not accident. And uh, based on these studies, I am tempting to ask if also uh, enforcement failure happens by, the, by design in some, in some countries. Uh, finally, uh, I want to also remind about this, um, the uh, challenges when it comes to journalists and when it also whistleblowers, as we discussed in the beginning of the day, uh, because um, Many whistleblowers in Europe are really struggling very hard. They feel threatened, including in the richest OECD countries. Um, and also we see that uh, the, the statistics uh, when it comes to protection of journalism is, uh, is, is uh, things are worsening regardless of what governments say. And while they speak about the importance of democracy, transparency, rule of law, and so on, um, we are not, the patterns do not look very good. So there's a really a big job to do. And, um, and, um, and, and this kind of detection is essential for, for enforcement. And as we heard, the DNB, the Norwegian bank representative, Lars Erik Bolster, who said today that um, the banks, they, he said that the banks, they have uh, incentives to enforce the AML regulations. And, uh, and they said they give it a high pr priority. And he said, thanks to the cases, of course. So he referred to the revelations by journalists and, uh, and that uh, such cases, such attention mattered a lot for their um, incentives to enforce and comply with the regulations. Um, and I think that is uh, important to remember uh, because all these things do not go well together. Um, especially unless uh, governments uh, beef up their efforts when it comes to this soft sort of enforcement. So with this, I know we are over time and I think I kept my 15 minutes. So uh, thank you very much. Um, it has been a very interesting present, uh, conference. Thank you so much, Tina. It's uh, very, very interesting uh, as always. Uh, and it also leaves me with some questions. We do not have so much time now. Um, Nicholas Lord had to go back to teaching. Uh, we are over time, but I do have a few questions. If you have the possibility, Tina. Sure. 
Um, you, you mentioned also the, the surprisingly uh, weak uh, implementation of laws. Uh, also, uh, political will is, is often behind that. Uh, you also mentioned that uh, some of the, the initiatives are facades, but in the lack of political will, in lack of implementation, in lack of uh, assistance, does that actually leave us back with uh, so-called multi-stakeholder initiatives? Um, uh, that's a good question. Um, and and the, I guess the answer is yes. I think it is extremely important that uh, civil society uh, is secured a more important role. I'm actually starting a research project on, on that question these days. Okay. Um, at the same time, I, what I did, because I worked for the World Bank and I was um, task manager for a project on cost, on transparency in the construction sector. And what we saw when we studied this initiative in six countries is that civil society often became an alibi and the, it, did, it didn't really change the power structures. So in, so in the construction projects, the companies and the governments continued to operate as before, but now it looked better with the civil society on board. So they were not given enough voice. So one of the things that we will be looking at in the project that I'm um, starting up is how to, what it takes to, to, to secure more uh, proper hearings where civil society can provide expert advice and what sort of criteria are necessary uh, in terms of both regulations and the quality of information from civil society. Okay, interesting. Um, also, Bradley uh, talked about uh, the importance of, of uh, penalties and, and, and jail time for CEOs, but your research, it seems like it, the, the consequences will be much softer is the con if the consequences of, of crime happens uh, abroad, if it's another country losing money. So that does not seem to uh, indicate the direction that Bradley wanted to, to see more of. Well, uh, generally, it's very difficult to punish a corporation. Because who do you punish? Do you punish? It's simply a structure. And uh, do you punish innocent owners? Do you punish uh, employees and so on? And in some situations, for example, if you have one or two producers of Corona vaccine, you don't want to punish that company too hard. <laughs> so, so, so we are looking at how this can happen. In some situation, we can use the corporate debt penalty in the sense of imposing a fine that is high enough to, so the company goes actually goes bankrupt if it's basically a criminal organization. In other situations, um, there's politically unwillingness to impose a sanction because it will hurt society as much as it hurts the, the company. And in such situations, obviously, there has to be well, at least in those circumstances, it has to be consequences for the responsible leaders. I think it has to be there has to be such consequences in all cases because uh, uh, the corporation and the and the leaders they are are separate subjects in terms of law enforcement. So there's no even if a corporation has been uh, given a huge penalty, you can still the prosecutors can still go after leaders. The problem today is that this is regulated by criminal law in many cases, and that secures protection for, for individuals in organizations because it's so extremely difficult to prove uh, that they knew what they were doing, if this was actually a bribe, if this was actually money laundering. And, um, and we have to, um, we need rules uh, where, where that place responsibility on leaders um, that is not criminal, that kind of non-criminal consequences. So at least there can be some criminal uh, consequences for those who are individually responsible for harmful actions. Yeah, I, I think you're out of time now. So I think we will just uh, leave it uh, there, Tina. Thank you very much for being with us today. And thank you also to Nicholas Lord. Um, I, I would like also to underline that the the importance of the relation uh, between whistleblowers and uh, the media is not always uh, probably pr uh, probably probably understood. But I think also, as Tina pointed out, that uh, these revelations of these banks uh, they have actually contributed to banks being more uh, alert, so that. 
there is a new direction. Um, I think I wanted to end on a more positive note after hearing that there are many things that does not move in such a positive direction. Um, but I would like to thank you so much to everybody who has been with us today and who have made this uh, conference possible uh, and to share with your uh, experiences. Uh, I think we have all learned a lot. Um, you have all contributed to making transparency possible through your different entry points. And I know that a lot of people will be inspired by your work. So uh, thank you so much. And also thank you to the Norwegian Research, Research Council uh, and to Oslo Met for the research cooperation where uh, this takes place. Uh, and I think also a lot of uh, journalists at Oslomet will be inspired by uh, what we have learned about today. So thank you very, very much to everybody who has participated. Thank you. <laughs>